Education Conference that is organized by Cavendish University Uganda in collaboration with the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum under the theme, Teaching and Learning in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, Threats, Opportunities, and Options for Higher Education Institutions. Today's conference has been planned to start at 9.30 a.m. and to end at 1.30 p.m. And we thank you all for uh, keeping time, as indeed we are ready to start. Dear esteemed guests, the promise and potential of generative artificial intelligence, or AI as it's called, has captured the imagination <laughs> of the whole world in the first half of this year, 2023. And it presents a significant revolution, certainly an important technology trend to be on the radar of leaders and stakeholders of higher education institutions in Uganda and across the world. While some expect AI to significantly disrupt higher education, others predict meaningful changes to the way teaching, learning, research, collaboration, and engagement will be conducted going forward, requiring amongst others, large reskilling efforts to address shifting needs in talent and content de delivery amongst others. Today, we are privileged to have a rich panel of presenters and moderators to help us understand, share, and deepen on the potential use cases and the skills, tools, and frameworks needed to capture value and manage the risks arising from this emerging technology of artificial intelligence. Today's virtual conference builds on the themes of the earlier virtual conferences we held in 2020, if you recall, in 2020, we had a similar virtual conference on effective teaching and learning during and post COVID-19. And then in 2021, we had another one on the theme, securing the new normal, protecting higher education institutions during and after COVID-19 pandemic. My first duty this morning is to introduce and welcome two seasoned higher education executives Professor John Francis Mugisha and Professor Eria Lugujo, who together represent the two institutions that have co-arranged today's virtual conference on artificial intelligence in teaching and learning. Professor John Mugisha is a distinguished professor of public health planning and management, a fellow of the Africa Institute of Public Health Professionals, and currently serves as the vice chancellor of Cavendish University, Uganda. At the same time, he serves as the vice chairman of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, a member of the board of the Uganda National Council for Higher Education, NCHE, representing private universities, as well as the vice chairman of the board of Inter-University Council of East Africa, IUCEA. He is a member of the Uganda National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, UNITA. On the other hand, Professor Eria Lugujo is a former vice chancellor of Ndeja University and the new executive director of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. He is a distinguished leader with a track record of service in various positions, having served as vice chancellor, dean, and head of different departments at Ndeja University and Makere University. He is also served as a member of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, since 1983. And for a period of eight years, he served as a member of UNESCO's executive board. He has also served as the chairperson of the Uganda Industrial Training Council, the policymaking organ of the Directorate of Industrial Training, and an advisory body to the Minister of Education and Sports on Technical and Vocational Education in Uganda. As a visionary leader, Professor Lugujo has been outstanding in mobilizing resources for the advancement of teaching and learning facilities from development partners, including the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the Faculty of Technology and the advancement of information technology at Makere University. Dear guests, I invite you to welcome our, our esteemed presenters. First, Professor John Mugisha, and then Professor Eria Lugujo, following which we will arrange to have the official opening of today's virtual conference, as we will shortly advise. 
Please, Prof. Mugisha and Prof. Uh, Lugujo, if you will turn on your camera whilst presenting, and the same for all those who will be presenting at today's virtual conference. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you God's blessing in today's virtual conference. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, David, for your kind introduction. And I would like to add my voice to yours to welcome the, the participants to this online uh, education conference. Thanks for sparing the time to participate in this very important conference. You will recall that when there was a Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum annual general meeting uh, here at Cavendish University of Uganda, we talked about uh, the invasion of teaching and learning, the invasion of society, and particularly of higher education by artificial intelligence and science and technology, advanced technological advancement. And we pointed out particularly chat GPT. You remember when we asked how many of the vice chancellors had chat GPT accounts, and there was almost none. And we promised that we would organize a conference to that effect. I understand that uh, a reminder was mentioned during the subsequent Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum meeting uh, that took place at Victoria University. And so we worked uh, with Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum to fulfill uh, on our promise. And today we are having this conference. I would like to thank the participants, I would like to thank the presenters, particularly uh, who agreed to share their expertise. And I think uh, David will be introducing the, the session chairs, and then the session chairs during their time in the, will be introducing the participants. But thank you for accepting to play very active roles uh, in this conference. Cavendish University of Uganda actually prides itself as a technology-enabled university. We installed a learning platform way back in 2017. Uh, that's why it became relatively easier for us during COVID uh, engineered shutdown, because all our students had already been used to some kind of technology and working with our platform. It was in 2018 when we introduced what we called a technology-mediated hour. The normal hours for a lecture, a contact lecture, had an additional hour that we called technology-mediated hour, where certain assignments uh, or some work to be taught or to be learned was purely online and using our platform. I also remember there was a bit of noise during that time when some of the students who didn't want to change went to the National Council to say uh, they, are, they, are, they are trying to do the teaching and creating an hour where we'll just be on our own, just on the internet. But eventually they realized that we are not just abandoning them. We are assigning them to engage in self-directed learning, following particular objectives, uh, but then to report and present on what they, they would have learned. But of course, there was also instructor-guided uh, learning uh, on the platform. So each of our contact students, just like the distance learning students, gets a platform account opened. When you report here, a platform account is opened for you as a student. And it means you can do some work online. You can ask questions online but also you continue attending your classes. There are some assignments that can be put online and others you can meet in class. And of course, because of the technology that we have, when I am running a normal class, all the DL students are able to follow at the same time. That's the, the extent which we have taken, have taken blended teaching and learning. Now, because of that use of technology, we were first hit by the advancements in artificial intelligence, especially chat GPT, which is relatively new. We quickly realized that some students who are not doing very well had all of a sudden they become very bright. They would write very good work and it's, how, how, how do they manage to improve in such a short time? Or to realize that 
Some had actually started using chat GPT and we are moving ahead of us uh, in the use of artificial intelligence uh, because we are the ones who had exposed them to technology. So we had to do, try and do quite a lot uh, in terms of um, learning how to use it and harness it for better learning, but not as an, to, to let it work as an obstacle uh, to teaching and learning. So this is very important for all of us. I know that when we are in Chigari, we listened to uh, a, a similar confession and story from Professor Jude Rebecca, who will be, who will be presenting um, uh, later in the, in the day. And, and so this is something we all need uh, to think about. I want to welcome you uh, for participating in this and thank the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum for accepting to co host this with us. I wish all of us uh, fruitful deliberations. Uh, one of the presenters, Professor Opio from Gulu, Peter Opio, uh, has had an emergency and will not be able to speak about the ethical concerns re relating to AI and, 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 and technology. Uh, but because of the importance of this, uh, if time allows, and the cha session chair, I, I will be able to share a few a few ideas on some of these ethical concerns because we have actually met them uh, in, in, in our use of technology in teaching and learning. So thank you very much. And I wish you and all of us fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor John Mugisha. I will now, I'll now invite Professor Eria Blugujo to also um, address today's virtual conference. On behalf of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum Secretariat, I'd like to welcome you to this conference where you are invited to participate and contribute to this seemingly new field of artificial intelligence. This conference is one of the series of activities to celebrate the Silver Jubilee of our forum. In this respect, allow me to thank Cavendish University, especially the Vice Chancellor, Professor Johnny Mogisha, who proposed the theme for this conference and also agreed to host us today. Artificial intelligence domain has been around for some time, but mostly exploited by the industrial sector. However, of recent, it has become clear that AI is pervading all the sub sectors of human dimension. Consequently, vice chancellors as heads of institutions of higher learning should internalize and study the impact of what AI can have on the delivery of higher education. What is at stake at the moment is to identify pathways to mainstream artificial intelligence in curricula of our programs. I have to add that AI is a science and science is about possibilities. And for us, we need to seize those possibilities and opportunities. As you will hear from the presentations of this in this conference today, you will note that AI models go beyond the ordinary current numerical techniques. And this case AI is going to be very useful in solving complex environment and climatic studies. We should however be mindful that for topic like AI, there are likely to be some resistance to absorption as Professor Mugisha has pointed out. But our task as educators 
is to identify the positive and progressive aspects. More so in teaching, learning, research, and development. AI is a, tra a transformative technology and has incredible potential to help humanity. However, it requires human responsibility and ethics in its application. By coincidence, in today's data monitor, page 16, under the book of the week, titled AI Dilemma, powered by Paul and Kleiner, some of these issues are discussed. <clears throat> Lastly, let me sincerely thank wholeheartedly all of the paper presenters and all those who have participated in organizing this webinar or this conference. They have demonstrated urgency and commitment to our request. I wish you good deliberation and I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Area Blugujo and Professor John Francis Mugisha for that uh, great preamble to today's virtual conference. Dear guests, we have now come to the official opening of today's virtual conference on artificial intelligence in teaching and learning. And to do this honorable task is none other than another pioneering professor, a trailblazer in higher education in our region, a leading veterinarian, academic, academician, and higher education leader. Professor Eli Katunguka Rajshah, the Vice Chancellor of Chambogo University and Chairman of the Uganda National Council for Higher Education, NCHE. Having studied at Makerere University and the University of Glasgow in Scotland, he started his work in 1979 at Makerere as a teaching assistant, then assistant lecturer, lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, and full professor, spanning the whole length of academic rank. And for 20 years, he was part of their senior academicians and academic administrators at Makerere University as head of department, deputy dean of faculty of veterinary medicine, Dean of Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Director of Research and Graduate Training. In 2014, Professor Katunguka joined Chambogo University as the first Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs. And in the same year, he acted as Vice Chancellor of Chambogo University for a period of three years, upon which he was appointed as a substantive Vice Chancellor, a position he has served to date. In 2019, he was appointed as chairman of the Uganda National Council for Higher Education. I will ask Professor Eria Blugujo to assist and to warmly welcome Professor Eli Katunguka Rachaya, the Vice Chancellor of Chambogo University and Chairman of the Uganda National Council for Higher Education to address the guests attending today's virtual conference and to officially open it. Thank you. I have known Professor Eric Atunguka since 1975 when I joined the university, Makerere University, and we've been, we have toiled together through hard, hardships. Professor Katunguka is a distinguished academician, an excellent administrator, a researcher. And so we are glad to realize that whenever these new eras of science come up, is still around to throw some light to us, to guide us. And on behalf of all the vice chancellors gathered this morning, wherever you are, kindly hear the liberation from Professor Eric Atunguka.
Chair, Professor Katunga just spoke to me uh, and, and said he's trying to join me. Um, so maybe in a few minutes, uh, he's already there. He has already joined. Um, it's a picture he has probably missed the, the standing introduction. Uh, and, and especially, particularly the words that Professor Ujo spoke about him. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Professor Katunga. Prof, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you, but we can't see you, but we can hear you. Seeing you would also add some value if you are in, in, a, in a position to be seen. You could un kind of unmute also the, the video. Mm -hmm. This will be off. This will be off. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prof. Are we ready to begin? Yes, we are ready, and they already introduced you and read your standing CV. And Professor Lugujo also spoke uh, very passionately about you and his experience with you since 19 early 70s. Uh, so it's your turn now. But you missed that kind and very generous and rich introduction of you. Okay, Prof, then. thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now clearly? Yes, we can hear you and we can also see you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. It's now my honor to give my remarks. Thank you for your uh, kind statements that you have made about me. Um, the chairperson and the executive committee members, Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, the leadership of Cavendish University of Uganda, specifically Professor John Mugisha, colleagues, vice chancellors, and principals of higher education institutions in Uganda, distinguished guests, ladies, and gentlemen. I wish to extend a very warm welcome to you all. This university's virtual conference on artificial intelligence and higher education in Uganda. I'm deeply honored to have been invited to address you as the chairperson of the National Council for Higher Education on today's remarkable theme, which signifies the convergence of two of the most impactful forces in our modern world, that is education and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has ceased to be a distant concept confined to the realms of science fiction. It is now an integral part of our daily lives, reshaping industries and societies across the globe. As educators and learners, it is our responsibility to ensure that artificial intelligence is harnessed to its fullest potential for the betterment of education and our nation at large. I was trying to educate myself about more about artificial intelligence. And I came to understand that these are machines or computer systems that think, that understand languages, that solve problems, that diagnose medical conditions, they keep cars on the highways, they, they autopilot planes, recently they play chess, and they paint imitations of, of paintings. So th these are computer systems with the ability to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. So with this advancement in technology, we have both opportunities and challenges, and we must understand it and employ it in our institutions. In Uganda, higher education landscape has been the beacon of progress 
fostering knowledge, critical thinking, and innovation for a number of generations. So as we step into this new era, where artificial intelligence is poised to revolutionize every facet of human existence, it is incumbent upon us to lead the charge and guide this transformation in a direction that aligns with our values, aspirations, and the unique needs of our society. Over the course of this conference, we will delve into discussions that span from the foundational concepts of artificial intelligence to its practical applications within higher education. We'll also explore how artificial intelligence can enhance teaching methodologies, personalize learning experiences, facilitate research breakthroughs, and ultimately equip our students with the skills required to thrive in the complex world that lies ahead. We will also explore how artificial intelligence can threaten our traditional and more familiar forms of assessment by helping to write essays and dissertations for students and literal answer exams for learners, rendering the tests and other assessment forms irrelevant and non-effective. This can have a negative impact on the quality of graduates we are producing and sending to the market. Fortunately, there's a way around every challenge, and I'm sure we'll explore ways to deal with such threats. We'll get even more challenges because I'm a veterinarian by training, and one of the things we train our students is what we call differential diagnosis. That is to be able to tell diseases that present similar signs apart and be able to come to a correct diagnosis. So now where you have a machine making a diagnosis, which is in most cases very accurate, then we need to rethink how we are going to train our students and give them those skills and competencies that they can use to thrive in the current changing world. As we engage in these conversations, we must remember that while technology provides the tools it is the dedication and passion of our educators, researchers, and students that will truly drive the advancement we seek. Let us also be mindful of the ethical consideration that artificial intelligence raises, ensuring that its implementation, its implementation respects human dignity, privacy, and diversity. I encourage all participants to share their expertise, experiences, and vision is freely. Let us embrace this opportunity to learn from one another, to challenge our assumptions, and to collaboratively chart a path forward that ensures Uganda remains at the forefront of educational innovation by continuing to produce graduates that are job ready, highly skilled, and competitive. I've also come to learn that artificial intelligence is very high on the political agenda of many, many developed countries, especially Europe. They have taken it a step further and put it as one of their priorities. In our discussions, can we engage government to be able to address artificial intelligence and put it on the political agenda so that they can fund it and also help universities to understand more about the implications of the advancement in this technology. The rest of the world began such conversation long ago. I'm therefore happy that we are working, we're waking up at this time. We all realize that we need to run when others are working. I therefore would like to extend my appreciation to the organizers, Cavendish University of Uganda and the Uganda Vice Chancellor Forum for providing leadership in an area that is both critical and urgent. And I want to encourage you to continue these discussions going forward. I also wish to appreciate the speakers and each and every participant because your participation contributes to the success of this conference. Your presence is a testament to your commitment to the future of education in our country in the era of technology advancement. We must employ technology to be able to address 
the quality of education, to be able to monitor and regulate higher education in this country, because the way it is expanding, the, the traditional methods will not help us. We need to embrace new technology. As I conclude, I'm excited by the possibilities that lie before us and the potential for artificial, artificial intelligence to elevate our higher education system to unparalleled heights. If we overcome the associated threats, let us embark on this journey with open minds, boundless curiosity, and a shared determination to shape the future of education in Uganda through the power of artificial intelligence. I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to wish all of us a productive and inspiring conference. With those words, colleagues, it's my singular honor to declare this conference officially open and wish you very fruitful deliberations of this very important topic of artificial intelligence. Once again, thank you, Professor Magisha, for providing this opportunity and this forum for us to share this uh, very important area of the advancement of our technologies. And may God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Elika Tunguka, the chairman of the Uganda National Council for Higher Education. And also thank you to Professor Mugisha of Cavendish University, Uganda, and Professor Eria Lugujo of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. Um, Professor Katunguka has reminded us about the need to harness AI for the betterment of education and our nations in, a various, in uh, various areas of methodology, uh, facilitating research, equipping students for work in, the, in a future that is complex, but also to address risks related to AI that could impact and threaten effective assessments, and also um, for us to address ethical risks. He has challenged us about the significance of AI and the need for us as higher education stakeholders to support government in policy formulation around this key subject, the need for us to run, not to walk, to move from traditional to modern technologies in higher education. And with that, because we will not have questions at this stage, I just would like to pass an abundance of gratitude to Professor Katunguka and to the presenters that have kicked off the first session. And soon I will hand over the moderation chair to Professor Mohamed Mpezim Higo the Vice Chancellor of Kampala International University, who will moderate the next session of today's virtual conference. But before I do so, um, allow me to introduce Professor Mohamed Mpezim Higo. He's a Ugandan agriculturalist who currently serves as the Vice Chancellor of Kampala International University in Uganda. He's also the treasurer of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. Having obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in forestry and a Master of Science degree in agriculture from Makere University, as well as a PhD in horticulture and landscape from the University of Reading in the UK, Professor Mpezim Higo served as a lecturer at the Faculty of Science, Department of Biological Sciences and Environmental Sciences, and on several postgraduate programs at the Islamic University in Uganda, IUIU, from 2005 to 2015. Pro Professor Mpezim Higo is a chairman of Kampala International University in Tanzania, is the chairman of the Virus Outbreak Data Network Africa, or president of Netherlands University's Foundation for International Cooperation, and the Uganda Country Representative and Executive Council Member of ICESCO, the Islamic World Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, and on the Islamic University in Uganda Main Scholarship Committee, and on the Alimihya Ali Sajabi Foundation Scholarship Board. He is a recipient of several education leadership awards. Our distinguished guests, 
please join me in welcoming Professor Mohamed Pezmihigo to lead us in the next session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, moderator. And uh, indeed, I want to thank uh, the Cavendish University, uh, headed by the Vice Chancellor, Professor John Mjisha, a good friend of mine, and also the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, where I'm a member of the Executive Committee. Um, I appreciate being given the opportunity to chair this session. As we know, we are talking about artificial intelligence. And in case there are other disruptions in the connection, I hope Cavendish University will have a backup plan. So we have always to be ready with the disruptions that are taking place. I want to request with there are three great speakers uh, who have been lined up uh, before we can have an opportunity to interact. Uh, before I request the moderator to actually highlight the briefs of each of the speaker before they speak, I want to add my voice to uh, the voices of those who have spoken before us. Uh, yeah, and also we understand, for example, Professor Katunguka is our regulator. He chairs the Council that regulates higher education in this country. And uh, we as institutions of higher learning uh, uh, have to comply with the regulations. Now, one key aspect of what is happening now with disruptive digital technologies is that the technology advancement is moving faster than the adoption by the institutions. And so you will find that even the regulators have got to uh, quicken the process of uh, trying to ensure that they, they move with the speed of the technology. Now, in our situation, in our higher education area network, some institutions may decide to invest uh, quite a lot in disruptive technologies for teaching, learning, research, and innovations, uh, while others may have challenges or may do the investment at a lower pace. And so there is a need for uh, within the higher education sector to look at our regulations since we have our chair of the council, so that if institutions become innovative, uh, that should actually guide or pave the way for adoption and also improvement on the benchmarks. And also I saw on our chat of the vice chancellor's forum where a member was actually trying to now try and challenge the existing benchmarks because the technology has come and therefore we need to think about it. So rather than challenge it, I think we should promote dialogue and the conversation. I hereby now uh, request our uh, master of ceremonies to kindly uh, pull up the uh, just a brief about our next speaker so that we can invite him to, and that is Dr. Oscar uh, Correa to speak, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Cavendish University in Zambia. So we are proud. Cavendish University is a regional university, and we are so proud and um, happy to host the presenter. So over to you, MC, uh, to do a brief, because I think you've done it very well. Thank you very much, Professor Pezim Higo. Um, with pleasure, I would like to introduce the profile of our next speaker, Dr. Oscar Correa, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Cavendish University, Zambia, who also has served as the Director of Technology at Marifa Education Holding, a Pan African uh, sponsor of universities, including Cavendish University, Zambia, and Cavendish University, Uganda. He is a highly experienced professional in the field of information technology spanning over 20 years and previously worked as a vice president of financial services at Mahindra Conviva, where he led one of the largest mobile money managed services. He served at Airtel Africa, holding several positions, including director um, and head of products and contributing significantly to the company's growth and success in Kenya. Throughout his career, he has worked in education, telecommunications, mobile financial services, IT or outsourcing, and product management, and gained extensive knowledge and skills in these areas, which 
we hope we will gain from today. Um, he has a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Ni Nairobi, postgraduate qualifications in telecommunications from Ashton University, as well as Warwick Business School. With pleasure, I would like to, on behalf of the moderator, welcome Dr. Oscar Correa. Um, yeah, with the permission of Professor Pezimhigo. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you very much for that brief. I also want to warmly welcome you, Dr. Oscar. You have 20 minutes to make your presentation. The comments members, you can post in the chat or you'll have an opportunity during the plenary session. So over to you, Dr. Oscar, and we are glad you were able to make it. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Cavendish Uganda, for inviting me to this prestigious event. Uh, I would like to just share my screen so I can start my presentation. Uh, kindly confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Unlocking the potential of artificial intelligence, exploring the impact on our society. Go ahead, sir. All right. Thank you very much once again. So uh, I'm very passionate about technology and especially artificial intelligence in these last few years. And I'd like to share some brief ideas about artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I did note that Prof Mugisha said that uh, members of the, of the executive committee had thought about ChatGPT and I'm hope, I hope Professor Mogisha is not expecting me to give a tutorial on ChatGPT, but I hope everyone in this in the audience has at least tried it at least once to see the power of artificial intelligence. So in front of you, you see my uh, agenda for today. And uh, I did note that uh, Professor Mogisha mentioned that uh, Professor Pio might not be around. So I hope you, you'll allow me Chair, to just speak a little bit more on the ethical considerations when we come to that. So the first thing is, what is artificial intelligence? You have... Thank you, Chair. And uh, a lot of uh, words come to mind, as you can see in that cloud over there. But a lot of our understanding of artificial intelligence is actually influenced by movies. Okay, this is a very famous movie uh, called The Terminator. Uh, and these are several other movies that have influenced what we think artificial intelligence will be. And uh, let's say they create a lot of uh, fear, all right, or, or of expectation. But uh, the truth is that artificial intelligence at this moment is still quite far from reaching what is portrayed in the movies. Today, what we see artificial intelligence is about, you know, whether we should think humanly, or think rationally. Now, ideally, we believe that humans think rationally, but actually we know that uh, actually there's quite a difference between humans thinking rationally and actually humans thinking humanly. And this is, let's say, the field of economics where although economists plan for rational behavior, people actually often act in different ways than they predict. And this is because we have things like uh, emotions, creativity, passions, all these kind of things actually make uh, what we would think to be rational to be different from what we would predict. So the question is, how do we get machines to actually think like this and then to act like this? Yeah, and this is where we talk about the domain of robotics, but there's a lot of artificial intelligence involved in simple softwares that we use many times on our phones, on our laptops, when we go on the internet, that we don't uh, realize is actually using artificial intelligence. So the question is, are we building systems that think like humans, that act like humans, or systems that think rationally and act rationally? Yeah. And generally, we tend towards this direction currently, where we're trying to build machines that we can, we can understand their actions and we can control their actions, and even to an extent, judge their actions. 
But if you'll allow me just to indulge you in a little bit of the history of artificial intelligence, it's not been a straight line as many other technologies. And in fact, ever since the first computers began to appear on the face of the earth, uh, people began to immediately jump to the idea that machines would start to emulate human beings. In the, the first, the first, let's say, direction artificial intelligence took was to say, look, let us try to build machines that work like the brain. And, uh, and that's why in the early 1940s, people started out looking at the artificial neuron. And the term artificial intelligence was actually coined in 1956 at a conference that involved some of the best scientists at that time. And at that time, we all know computers were very expensive and difficult to build. So we didn't see a lot of progress in artificial intelligence until the 60s, when let's say there were more dedicated computers built for this. But there was a lot of expectation and many of the early scientists believe that already in the 70s and 80s, we'd start to see robots moving around, but that didn't happen. In fact, what did happen was the oil crisis of the 1970s. And since most of the funding for computers actually came from the government, a lot of that funding dried up and created what we call the first AI winter. In the 80s, uh, academics continued to work on, uh, on, on artificial intelligence. And uh, again, the belief was that we could put knowledge into machines and people developed things that were called expert systems. Unfortunately, when these expert systems went out into the world, they couldn't quite do the tasks that humans did. So again, there was the funding for artificial intelligence dried up. What the what key researchers and companies did, there was still a belief that AI would still uh, succeed was to focus on games. So for instance, IBM built a computer that would beat the chess champion, Gary Kasparov in 1997. And, and various other IT companies began to experiment, especially in the gaming world, to show that humans could, uh, sorry, that computers and artificial intelligence could play against humans in well-defined situations. And then we go into the early 2000s, where actually there's a, there's a famous uh, artificial intelligence system from IBM called IBM Watson that actually won a, a quiz show which asked trivia questions and it proved to be much more efficient than your average human being. And actually from that point on, IBM realized that it was on a very dangerous trend that it was, it was competing, it was putting humans against machines. And since then, IBM has actually stopped or reduced its focus on machines fighting or competing with humans. Because unfortunately, humans have been taking a beating. Uh, and then in the early 20s, sorry, in the early, early 2000s, uh, 2010, going forward, more and more technologies began to come out. And in the next slide, we see some of the more famous technologies that came out. Uh, they were GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks. So these are the ones that create images, uh, deep fakes as we know them. And then also people began to build databases of data and to try to analyze text. And actually in 2017, we have a new technology that came out, uh, a new type of algorithm called transformer algorithm, which today is the foundation of ChatGPT. Yeah. And <clears throat> over time, people have been uh, working on these models and improving them until what became very clear at the end of last year is that all of a sudden these models became available to the general public. So what we know as ChatGPT, you know, 3.5 and 4, the, what we use right now has actually been around for five years. It's just that they put a very nice interface to it. So what is driving artificial intelligence? So the, the first thing is, is computing power. So there was a theory many years ago that computing power is doubling every 18 months. But the truth is it's actually going, going getting faster. It's, it's, it's improving at a higher speed than even 18 months. 
And then currently there is a lot of research going on around next generation computing in the area of quantum, uh, quantum computing. Yeah, so just a brief on quantum computing. Quantum computing is uh, a, a method where you use, uh, uh, you know, equations of electromagnetic magnetic waves to perform the normal calculations that computers perform, but it's much, but they work much faster than the normal computers. And uh, basically, this will like. Uh, cause a, a few problems in the industry, especially the security industry, where all the modern encryption methods will break down. But just to give you a simple uh, insight into this technology, basically this technology is looking to harness the technology that plants use to convert sunlight to sugar and energy. Yeah, what they're doing is they're trying to figure out how plants use photosynthesis to actually convert sunlight. And what's amazing about plants is they do it at room temperature. These machines have been designed and they have to be kept at very low temperatures to achieve the quantum effect that's needed for computing. So that means that the industry is actually going to progress a lot faster in the next few years. Another thing is we have seen a lot of data. This is another driver of AI, data. And you can see that in maybe the last 10 minutes that I've spoken, you know, there's like two, 24 million Google searches that have happened across the globe. So there's a rapid explosion of data and this data is actually predicted to get much bigger. It is actually predicted now that with ChatGPT, data is increasing or doubling globally every month. Yeah, and that is a conservative estimate. The last uh, driver is in terms of the actual algorithms. So algorithms have been rapidly improving, and this is one of the reasons why AI has grown in the last few years. In fact, I mentioned to you one of these algorithms called the transform algorithm that is behind the success of ChatGPT. Moving on, it's important to understand that uh, we're still far from the kind of fancy images that we see in the movies. Today, we are very much successful at something which is called narrow AI, which is very specific tasks on artificial intelligence, uh, recognizing images, natural language processing, and playing games. And also this alpha fold is used for predicting uh, protein structures. Yeah. What is happening now more and more is that uh, people, researchers, developers are combining these different uh, narrow AI skills into a single system. And you see this especially in driverless cars. And these driverless cars are using multiple AIs to form something that we call broad AI. What we're yet to see, and this is potentially coming with the improved processing power, is general AI, where machines start to exhibit you know, real and true human behavior. So moving on, you know, we, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but going a little bit into it, one of the big areas of artificial intelligence, so one of the subsets of artificial intelligence is the, is the area of machine learning, where basically what we do is we take a lot of the data, and that's why you saw data as one of the key drivers, and we look at those that data and we try to make patterns out of it. Uh, you When you take this artificial intelligence uh, algorithms and you put it into a robot, we call it, or into a machine, we call it embodiment. And that's when you have robotics. So basically, you know, robots are nothing more than the embodiment of artificial intelligence. So within machine learning, we actually have some algorithms that are very, that, that really can analyze and find deep patterns, patterns that we typically as humans wouldn't recognize. And this is what makes artificial intelligence so powerful, that they are able to see things that we normally would not see. And this at the same time brings with it the ethical challenges because sometimes we don't understand why a machine has made such a decision. Yeah, and so this is where we have a lot of ethical concerns, even though we are already using these algorithms quite extensively. So these are some of the areas where the algorithms are used. You know, machine learning, we just talked about it. 
especially due to the predictive anal analytics, speech, vision, <coughs> natural language proce processing. Okay, this is where we talk about, this is where all our students are trying, uh, this is the tool that all our students are using to get through their exams. Okay, now they use it, they're asking ChatGPT, please answer me this question. ChatGPT goes out there, grabs a lot of data uh, from its knowledge base, it summarizes and presents to the student. Expert systems, planning and optimization, and then lastly, robotics. So just to go into some very specific use cases. So we've, we've I've heard speakers speak about, you know, using it in healthcare. So we have AI powered medical diagnosis. You can have personalized treatment plans, drug discovery. So for instance, Moderna, one of the suppliers of the COVID vaccine used artificial, inten artificial intelligence intensely. Yeah, we also have virtual healthcare and AI powered surgery. So for instance, with AI powered surgery, I know people who have actually gone through this you know, it actually helps the surgeon. Basically, it's not that the machine is completely doing the surgery, but it's working side by side with the surgeon to reduce the area of impact. So, you know, reducing the time for recovery and giving a better health impact. <clears throat> so it actually holds a lot of potential for Africa because it could reduce the cost of healthcare in Africa. And also it could enable like more remote diagnosis, you know, because our populations are spread out without infrastructure. So it could make a lot of benefit within our African populations. But at the same time, it brings a lot of ethical considerations in terms of data and what people do with our data. And there's a very recent case in Kenya where a company was scanning iris data from Kenyans just for for a small amount of money. <clears throat> in education, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think uh, there's another speaker uh, after me on this. So I will just highlight some of the, the main items here. But one, one area which I am passionate, and excuse me if I speak about it, is gamified learning, where you engage students in, in, in exercises that they enjoy to the point that learning becomes indistinguishable from, from enjoyment. <clears throat> in the workspace, okay, we're seeing AI more and more, especially in uh, customer service, in recruitment, okay? So it needs to be carefully used in recruitment. For instance, there's a famous case of Amazon using AI and uh, the AI tool was basically looking for white males and they actually had to stop the AI tool Smart factories, so basically AI, AI is very much linked with the, the fourth industrial revolution, IoT, all these um, systems use AI simply because the sensors in fourth generation produce so much data, it's important to decide what's really important. Self-driving vehicles, okay, there's a big debate how they're going to get implemented in Africa, but then AI-powered marketing, we see this a lot with Facebook. So it increases, it has a lot of benefits, <clears throat> increased efficiency, accuracy, so you get personalized uh, results, so personalized products. We all see this. Every day, we, we, whatever we Google, the next day we're seeing adverts about it. It saves money because you're no longer broadcasting to the whole population, and it gives better customer experience. <clears throat> and then, uh, but it has challenges, okay? And the biggest challenge that we as educators are often worried about is job displacement what is going to happen to those jobs? And, uh, and okay, I have no simple answer. I guess the big, my, my biggest answer is to say we need to train our students in artificial intelligence. So we'll come back to that a bit. <clears throat> and then obviously there, you know, there's a loss of human interaction, which is something which we have also experienced during COVID. Okay, and then also AI is becoming very popular at home where we have smart devices, virtual assistants, all right, and uh, again, it has very similar benefits and it can definitely help in areas of safety and hygiene and even collect data. So there are many possible uses where, you know, people are old and vulnerable and it can collect data and, and, and send early warning alerts. There is another use of AI, I don't, know, I, I don't have time to show it here, but there are even AI, there are robots that actually do cooking, all right? 
you actually have them now coming in restaurants and they can cook for you and you don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know the, the the chefs being in the kitchen all the time you can have a robot do it but but also in the same way you can have robots doing healthcare you know especially for the elderly and again we have ethical considerations again uh, in the arcs we're seeing a lot of AI coming in AI is generating a lot of images. Uh, we talked about copying paintings, but AI can even create its own images. There's a book here. This is a book on cooking written by an AI. Okay. I'm, I've not tried any recipes there, but uh, feel free. And then, for instance, the picture here, this person actually doesn't exist. This was created by an AI. It just put pictures, it put eyes, nose, mouth together and made a person. And these are different uh, vendors who do different technologies. And then in farming, I think... You, you, have, you, have, you have five minutes so that okay. you can wind up. Please. Okay, thank you. So I think, uh, Prof. Fraser, Migo, you'll be very interested in the use of AI in agriculture, you know, especially Absolutely. with... Uh, Absolutely, yeah. The use in precision farming, being able to detect diseases by just looking at the at photos of, of the fields, improving yield, robots that can do, you know, picking. So, for instance, in Kenya, we already have tea picking robots, uh, monitoring livestock. Again, there's a whole list of things that can be done. So, one thing to just stress about AI is that, you know, AI is a confluence of three fields. One field is computer science, that is where you have the uh, let's say the technologist. AI is also involves the use of mathematics. So anyone who's going to use AI will have to know a little bit of mathematics. But the biggest biggest contribution to AI is actually the domain knowledge. So none of these things can be actually created without the, the knowledge of the domain. So the implication for education in that, that case is that we need to introduce AI potentially into all of our courses. Talking about government, AI go government can use AI for fighting crime, disaster relief, border control, monitoring terrorists that they come through the border, elections. I think we've heard about that, and even in policy making. So AI has the potential to reduce bias, uh, to improve decision making, and even prepare, prevent fraud. Just uh, a very recent report in in uh, March 2023 on on policy making with AI shows that actually potent, there's a lot of opportunity in policy making and every policymaker you talk to about AI is very keen on it, but there's digital leadership that's missing. And this is, I think, somewhat, something that was mentioned by Prof. Katunguka at the beginning. Uh, but we have challenges of data in, Af in, in Africa in general, data access. And these are things that we need to look at and improve. And coupled with that, we need to make sure we have laws in place. In, in addition, we also need to see how we can build an ecosystem that supports AI's solutions as well as create it as a future research agenda. One thing that is a bit scary is that most policymakers don't see digital infrastructure and digital skills de development as a priority. Okay, and with this, I conclude with a discussion on ethics. So just to consider, you know, with ChatGPT now, it is so easy to actually hack into systems. You can ask ChatGPT to crack a system for you. You can be very selective about people you target. You can see in Ukraine, this is a photo from Ukraine where they are starting to use autonomous weapons. This is a, a, a Reaper drone from the US Air Force. Again, many of these uh, machines are using AI because they're simply too far from their users to be, to allow their users to make decisions. So they actually make decisions themselves. China is famous for its uh, surveillance and we've heard of election fraud. So basically the main thing we need to understand about uh, ethics in AI, and this is based on a, on a guidelines. So, so the first thing to realize about AI is it's difficult to regulate AI. With data, we have got data protection laws. We have the Office of the Data uh, Controller. Okay, we have very clear laws on data protection, but we cannot use the same laws for AI because AI is a different ballgame. So, for instance, we need to consider human agency. 
whether humans are part of the system or not, the robustness of the systems, you know, are the systems safe, the data, where are we getting the data and how is the data being kept, transparency. So when the machines make a decision, can we understand how they made that decision? And this is one of the biggest ethical concerns that we don't understand how machines make decisions. Diversity, how do we ensure that we are handling the whole spectrum of society? And then how are we making sure that the machines are not going to decide they're going to take over the world? And lastly, accountability. So one of, and this is my last point, on accountability, one of the problems we have is that, you know, when we, when we manufacture a gun, if you take a gun and you shoot somebody, we know it was you who shot, the gun can't shoot somebody. But when we have AI, you know, AI is the software developer, we have the implementer, we have the person who actually used it. It's difficult to know who is the one who made the mistake. Yeah, so these are one of the big challenges, the ethical consideration for AI. And with that, Chair, I conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Members, can we, in one or another, recognize an excellent presentation by Dr. Oscar. You've really uh, triggered our minds. The, the, most, the most scary uh, about this, the most scary thing about this, what is uh, uh, deep learning? We'll try to mute. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, MC, for the noise. Yes, I was saying that uh, one of the most scary things really is uh, how AI uh, can actually reach some accurate conclusions without the human intervention. This is very dangerous, I think. And that's where uh, it can actually get wild. But I think these are some uh, of the things that can be done. So according to the schedule, um, the questions are supposed to come, I think, in the general discussions, comments, and so I'll, I'll request that uh, uh, you allow us, uh, Dr. Oscar, uh, be online so that you are put in perspective the submissions that are going to follow. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, in your respective capacities, I think Oscar really raised uh, fundamental issues that um, uh, uh, border on the issue of, uh, uh, you know, thinking humanly or, you know, thinking rationally. Yeah, this is something very interesting. And also acting humanly or acting rationally. And so the borderline where AI comes on board and where our young minds in universities and higher education institutions, uh, once they are excited, I think we still have quite a bit of a challenge in limiting how far they can go. And already we have these challenges coming on board in terms of management of exams and things like that, especially when we get online and we require uh, assignments and tasks to be done. So let me now request David again, uh, not David, sorry, I think yeah, David, uh, to be able Yes, our MC. Sorry, Prof. Yes, Prof. Um, I think we had lost you there for a moment when you froze. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear yes. me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, I said, uh, please give a brief about uh, Professor Jude before he comes on board. But what I was saying is that um, we this is something that was driving innovations using AI. Uh, the limit is still a challenge. How do we control this is, I think, again, we'll need to use technology. And, and I'm saying there's already a big challenge for us, especially if we are planning uh, to uh, embrace, you know, you know, online learning and research and innovations, and also the security of what we do, the ethical issues that have been raised by uh, Dr. Oscar. Uh, this is something that comes on board. And we are universities anyway, so we should face the challenge and address uh, all these needs. Can you over, over to you now, sir, so that you can briefly yes. talk about Jude? Sure. Before I introduce Professor Jude Lubega, uh, Chair, I would like to ask that we 
listen to Professor Jude Lubega and then have the, the general discussions and comments, and then uh, have Dr. Olive pushed to the next session that will be moderated by Professor George Nasinyama. And that is because Oscar's presentation together with uh, Professor Jude Lubega's presentation are very, uh, are very AI heavy. And, and yet we have absences from Prof. George, from Prof. Peter Upio, who was meant to, to present, but is away on, a, on, a, on an emergency, and then Dr. Hamis Mugendawala, who uh, being a policy advisor is, is away as well on account of, of government duties related to you know, recent developments with the World Bank. So if you agree, then I can proceed to invite Professor Jude Luvega. I can introduce Professor Jude Luvega and proceed on that basis. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, with pleasure, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Professor Jude Luvega, who is the Vice Chancellor of Mkumba University and a professor of information technology with vast experience in IC in information and communication technologies for development, spanning 25 years in the education sector and somebody that has participated in a number of research projects at national and international levels, as well as developing solutions on a global scale. Professor Jude Luwega, prior to being uh, the Vice Chancellor of Mkumba University, served as a Professor and Deputy Vice Chancellor of Utamu for a period of seven years. He also served as the Deputy Dean and the Head of the Information Technology Department at Makere University for uh, five years. Also as CEO for Eight Tech Consults, a leading ICT consulting company in Uganda, and has been listed as among the 100 movers and shakers in corporate online learning uh, for 2018 in Africa. He has got a bachelor's degree in applied science and a bachelor's degree in computer science and statistics from Uganda Matters University, as well as a PhD in computer science and a master's degree in computer systems networking and telecommunications from the University of Reading in the UK. He, like me, is a Rotarian, only he's a member of the Rotary Club of Namasua and a member of several boards. So with that introduction, I'll hand over back to you, Chairman, uh, for this session, Prof. Uh, Mohammed. Thank you very much, uh, members. Uh, I share two things, uh, probably many more with Professor Jude Lubeck, he's a vice chancellor, and he also went uh, to Reading, a very great university in the UK. Over to you, Jude. And thank you so much, uh, Chair, uh, for the session. And um, Cavendish University, Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, for giving me the opportunity to also come and uh, share uh, with you what I really want to uh, share. Um, a minute. Okay, um, I'll share my slides uh, to go straight to the point. Are my slides visible? Chair? Yes, yes, for sure, they are. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this morning, um, I want to share with you um, on an interesting area concerning integrating AI in teaching and learning opportunities and threats. But for the sake of uh, good bandwidth, if I'm going to take off my video, so that I cannot uh, lose you or lose me at a certain point. So I take off my video now. Since you have seen it's a human being and not an AI robot uh, trying to talk to you. Okay, lad ladies and gentlemen. Professor Jude, you have 20 minutes, so you can time yourself. I'll give you a little reminder, uh, 10 minutes to time and also five minutes to the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so colleagues, um, 
I just want to start by actually uh, alerting each, each, one, each and every person on the call that uh, technology is advancing daily. And this is why many people have picked a lot of interest in artificial intelligence. And in some of the service sectors like uh, education, we seem to have not realized all the priorities that we need for teaching and learning. We've not yet met them today. For example, eradicating literacy out of the world. Many people are still not yet educated. How can we use AI to do uh, that for us? Also something that we need to uh, take note of is that um, um, as the advances of technology go on, many tech, uh, educators are just simply wondering, what is it really going to be in the future? If AI has come and is trying to erode the powers of the teacher, what are they going to do? And what happens to the teacher? As uh, Dr. Oscar indicated to, to us, AI is not new, but it's coming more visible now because it's becoming more advanced within the uh, several sectors, including education. So the question should be, we as educators, what should we be able to do in order to explore the opportunities that AI is not uh, trying to bring to us. I remember when chat GPT came into light, many people were scrambling, what is happening, what is happening? But many chat robots have been in place. But because this one has become more advanced and uh, it has now taken uh, many of the educators by surprise, they felt there's something that, that needs to be done. So many people in the education sector are pondering here and there. How can we use AI capabilities to support inclusivity among students and teachers? How can we use AI to enable writing all improving lessons here and there, process findings, choosing and adapting materials for lessons, and so on? But also, there are new demands for change within the education sector which are calling for, can we be able to allow the introduction of AI within our teaching and learning in a better way to support us since it is regarded as a very powerful and can really support our education abilities. So Dr. Oscar has already uh, talked about what AI is all about but I just want also to give a very brief um, uh, definition about it. It's just a, the ability of a digital computer to perform tasks that are typically associated with the intelligent beings. And he has given you a very good history, but I start uh, for me right from 1956 by John, and is really, really, really regarded as one of those people who re really pushed AI to what it is right today. So AI is just uh, having a machine being able to learn on its own, adapting to various scenarios and even correcting itself. And therefore, AI depends quite a lot on data that is stored out there. So we can never separate AI from data science. That we need to know. So the question would be, amongst you while attending, which one of these have you used before? Some of you have started simply using chat GPT, but several of these are already and probably all doing almost the same thing. There are several quite uh, different branches of artificial intelligence that probably we need to know and which are already impacting on the education sector. We have machine learning. This is where machines are able to learn from the data without being explicitly programmed. You bought several books in Amazon and all that. They, they, they've seen you doing ABCD and then you see, receive an email, something proposing to you something. There's something that has been able to learn your trends and things of that kind and able to, to tell you where you need to go and what to buy in terms of the education books and the like. Neural networks is also another very good one 
uh, where we have very many interconnected nodes that process information by passing it through a series of mat mathematical operations. And this is very, very quite important for us that uh, it can do a lot of uh, detections on what is happening around you. If it's within an education institution based on the data it has, it's able to do quite a lot of things. The other category is what we call robotics, uh, which is also another branch of uh, technology that deals uh, with design and construction. But today we have what we call robotics uh, tutors online which are more of an intelligent robots that can adapt to individual learning styles and pace, offering a more engaging and interactive personalized learning experiences. So these are common now today within a very, very uh, advanced uh, learning management systems. Then we have what we call expert systems, and these are supporting quite a lot already in, uh, in education. We have what we call intelligent tutoring systems which are used to analyze students' performance, identi identify areas of weaknesses, and offer targeted feedback and guidance. These are already in being integrated in learning management systems like Blackboard and Light. There's adaptive learning. Adaptive learning, uh, we have platforms out there that adapt the curriculum and instructional content based on the individual student needs and styles. Because today we are saying it's students need to be able to learn in their own way based on their learning styles. And therefore systems out there that can support these are very, very, very advanced are uh, already in place. Virtual assistants, more of uh, chat bots, chat, chat GPT and the like. These can assist students and teachers by answering questions, providing information and guiding them uh, through various educational activities. So because chat, chat GPT came into play, people thought that, oh, it's something very new uh, here. But uh, some of these have been here before. We just need to know them and uh, be able to adapt. The other category of artificial intelligence is what we call the natural uh, language processing. And I think also uh, Dr. Ask, uh, Oscar mentioned about, uh, about this. We used more into speech and text, translations and the like, being able to support yeah, uh, learning, uh, moving it from a different language to another. And then the Fuse logic, which is more into the mathematical, but it supports a lot of what we call facial recognition, especially uh, in areas where we are doing online assessments. The systems that are able to know that whether you are the actual person who is supposed to be doing the assessment based on your facial recognition are using a lot of Fuse logic. So all these categories of uh, uh, artificial intelligence are already in use, but we should be asking ourselves uh, uh, questions. What are we really going to be able to do? I just want to uh, indicate to you that uh, there's one uh, company that say that with generative artificial intelligence added to the picture, 30% of the hours work today could be automated by 2023 in the United States. What does it mean? that even the work within the education sector, people will have to lose their jobs and then it goes to the AI. So it is here with us, it's getting more advanced and we can't run away from it. So these are so many uh, examples of AI tools that are out there. The question would be probably to you, which one of them have you been able to use? How are we integrating it in education? There are so many ways where we are integrating AI in education. I've already talked about artificial intelligence. Um, uh, I mean, adaptive learning, which has a lot of uh, dealing with data mining and optimizing cost offerings, uh, virtual classrooms, intelligent teaching robots and bots, based uh, teaching evaluations, so many models have been built based on AI for supporting uh, evaluation of teaching. There's what we call smart campuses. And then decision-making, which is able to leverage data analytics and track students' performance, identify patterns, and make data-driven decisions to improve teaching and learning outcomes. We quite collect a lot of information within the education sector, but the question is, how do we use this information to make decisions that matter. There's what we call personalized education, which I've talked about there. 
already that is able to personalize your learning experience to your needs. Then very important, AI has come in so handy to support administration. Tasks such as exam and uh, test assessments, it can be done through AI, universal access to education, and then predictive education. All these have been seen to be supported by AI already. And if we are not doing any of this, we are just lagging behind. And then that creates what we call a digital divide among the already developed countries and the rest of us in Africa and other areas. So we need to leapfrog and move faster. There's what we call class applications and collaboration. In the past, people knew that uh, virtual reality would never even transform into something else. It's now moved from virtual reality to augmented reality, now to what we call merge reality, which merges virtual reality and augmented reality. I first interfaced with virtual reality in 2001. Just imagine how many years have elapsed and where we are now. What I used in 2001 is not what we use today. They're completely different. So we have to move faster. There are quite so many opportunities out there that we can tap in uh, in AI uh, for education. Um, one of them would be 24 seven access to learning. What I can say is that with AI driven digital learning systems, students can learn anywhere at any time, supported by these AI either tools, bots, and things of that kind, generating smart content with AI. The ability to prepare content to be perceived in new ways of visualization, simulations, web-based study environments, and so on and so forth, is now possible with support from AI. Self-paced learning, because systems are being uh, built uh, to support personalized learning, then students are able to pace themselves as they are able to learn. They want to learn in the way they want to learn based on their learning styles. Inclusivity is it possible that the systems AI can be able to support even people with the blind, people who are, uh, so many people who are persons with disability, based on their disability, they can be able to support them in teaching and learning. Um, there are so many benefits as uh, you see personal assistance, around the clock support, trouble free tutoring, learner centric approach, easy admission management, easy evaluation systems, uh, multiple learners approach, and so on and so forth. So the question is what would we want to use AI for as institutions of learning? Because there's quite a lot there that can be utilized to support our uh, teaching and learning. I just want to give you a sample opportunity that I, uh, was brought out in 2002, uh, 2022. According to Tenadio, AI in the education sector is expected to grow by $370.3 million between 22 to 26. So the question is, where are we in that? It's never going behind, it's just pushing ahead. So many threats also can come with the adoption of AI. One is reduced human interaction. We look at this that uh, self-paced courses isolate, uh, where I, learners are isolated from each other and uh, I limit. These can hinder a bit of learning. So the way we do it is also needs to be rethought through. So what are we doing so that we don't lose the other element, but are able to simply utilize AI to support our teaching and learning? They could have bias and discrimination. If a, a model that has been built on AI utilizes wrong data, then you could have already a bias in there because many of these models are trained based on the data that has been collected. So we need to be careful what data are we using to derive the models we are going to deploy. Surveillance and privacy. With AI, the capability of uh, surveying is quite a lot. 
Today, we are seeing if you leave your phone on and it's connected onto the internet, I can be somewhere and switch on your camera and turn it in any angle I want and I can see anything within your room at any time. This is possible with AI. So surveillance, even when it comes to teaching, copying and all that can happen and things of that kind. So we just need to be careful. Data privacy and security, because there's quite a lot of information, amounts of data that is being collected, you unknowingly. So it just takes everything it picks around you. So it's a bit uh, entering into your privacy and collecting an information, information that even you are not aware about. Overdependence on AI can be a problem. We are seeing students today that are over relying on chat GPT to derive for them uh, proposals, dissertations, and the like. But we thank uh, the developers out there that uh, now we have software that can be able to detect even AI uh, derived content. Uh, for example, Tanitin has already developed uh, tools able to detect. Uh, uh, content from chatbots like uh, ChatGPT. Then job displacements. Yes, we're never going to stop this with advancement for, uh, in technology. We just need to accept that uh, this has come to stay, but how do we work with it and have uh, something meaningful? But jobs will be displaced. I'm winding up, but the future of AI in teaching and, uh, uh, and education, we need to be able to invest in AI and that type of infrastructure. If we are going to be able to realize or achieve what we really want to achieve, it doesn't come easy. We need to invest in the infrastructure. We need to be able to develop ethical guidelines to govern us, policies here and there. I'm glad that we're already thinking about engaging government to be able to come up with their guidelines and policies and things of that kind. But we need to move faster because it's already here with us. We need to be able to foster collaborations. We are not going to be able to nurture this alone. As institutions, we need to come together and be able to do things together when it comes to some of these things. There is very high end technology that needs to be invested if we are going to really deploy a very, very advanced AI, uh, uh, I would say systems. So we need to come together. We may not be able to handle it individually. Then we need to do a lot of professional development for the faculty, the staff. How are they able to detect, uh, for example, a content that has been developed by uh, these uh, AI chatbots and things of that kind? So we need to be able to build capacity for the staff. We need to do a lot of sensitization the way we are doing it now so that it can support them to know that uh, it is with us. We need to safeguard our education systems in this way. As we do all that, we, the humans, have to stay in the loop because we really develop these models. We need to do them within educational system perspectives, but remaining in the loop. Otherwise, we, when we let go, we shall receive, uh, I would say, nightmares like in the movies that uh, Dr. Oscar, uh, Oscar uh, showed as Terminator, when something can go uh, beyond what we are uh be, be beyond 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 what you 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 think as i i end i just want to throw some questions to us out there is artificial intelligence taking over academia what is the future role of educators in higher education how best can higher education institutions learn and make use of ai and data science to ensure that both students and educators use the most of it I have a colleague in Marymount yesterday, he told me it has been adopted now in their institution, but the student has to show what percentage of the content or the assignment has been generated by uh, AI or chat GPT, th things of that kind. Are we seeing a new paradigm shift in assessment? Is there a need of new models of assessment? What is the quality of graduates from higher institutions? Can they think on their own? yet AI models have been doing assignments for them. These are things for us or questions for us to ponder about because we cannot be left behind, but we have to move ahead. Let's be ready to change ways of instruction and assessment. 
to be relevant within the 21st century. And failure to do so, AI will automatically take charge of your job and even do it better than you as an educator. AI has the potential to positively transform higher education by making it accessible, inclusive, and intuitive for both teachers and learners. But we need to be aware of the challenges that it also brings with it. Chair, I want to thank you so much. I think my 20 minutes have elapsed and uh, I hand over back to you, uh, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jude. Um, again, we appreciate you've made uh, this discussion. You have uh, also guided at the University Council of West Africa regional meetings and several other places. I do also remember uh, you made a very nice presentation during the COVID time when we went to State House and you are really trying to see what are the available options for us uh, to get, to digitize learning? And of course, the National Council for Higher Education created for us a very good uh, uh, framework, which was the open distance and e-learning framework, and, and also that provisional uh, acceptance that was given to drive education without uh, being significantly affected. So thanks a lot for that. and. Um, I need some guidance from our MC. I have also noticed uh, the Vice Chancellor Cavendish University has actually also guided uh, that in the discussion that is going to ensue, of course, uh, issues of ethical considerations have to be brought out. I know Oscar and uh, uh, Jude were not necessarily given that aspect, but in the discussions and the issues that are coming up, uh, you should be able to respond to some of these issues, uh, as we know, uh, they do affect us. And I like the, <laughs> the overridable uh, aspects uh, that we need to develop. I think technology has to deal with technology to address all these threats. So uh, guidance from the MC, we had allotted 30 minutes for the discussion for three presentations. We have only had two. So can you guide, please, so that uh, I can moderate the Q and A session. Sure. Um, I would I would guide that we could go in the twenty minutes or thirty minutes if it requires. All right. So now, uh, members, those of you who can speak, and we have said, uh, it would be a good idea for us to uh, mute the videos where you have a challenge of the connectivity. You could post questions uh, in the chat room. Uh, or you could also raise your hand up and then we'll give you an opportunity. Uh, please just tell us your name, your institution, and go straight to your comments, remark, or question, or clarification, or even a supplement. I want to thank Jude and uh, Oscar for curtain raising this discussion. And they have given us a lot of information. Jude, for example, was really, uh, you know, there are a lot of commonalities uh, with Jude and Oscar about the types, the tools, the applications, and also opportunities. And I like the one where you actually presented the humans in the loop, uh, where you are putting like safety valves around the application of AI and the future in if, if we are to continue uh, in, with higher education. Uh, so over to you members, any person in the uh, in the room, uh, who would like to put up their hand. Otherwise, I can go straight to the chat room and I start from there. Uh, please do not feel offended if we do not read. Uh, Professor Georgina Sinyama's hand is up. Please uh, unmute and uh, go on. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Mohammed. Uh, and I want to, I want to uh, appreciate uh, the presenters, Dr. Oscar, Professor Judy Vega. Um, um, MC assists the chair to assist the chair to mute some of the speakers. Will Basebu, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. 
And I want also to appreciate uh, uh, Professor Eli uh, Katunguka, uh, who gave the opening uh, remarks uh, for this conference. Uh, what is running through, um, of course, all these um, uh, Uh, so, uh, sorry, you are muted. Please unmute. Yeah. Now, um, you, now the, you can. Oh, the you moderate uh, thinks somebody unmuted me. Uh, I'm saying that um, uh, we do recognize the tremendous benefits of um, of AI um, uh, to humanity, and this has been happening over time. Uh, but then um, the issue of uh, data access. Um, as a, a, a challenge, uh, particularly uh, for AI in in Africa, and I want to believe in other developing countries is the same thing. And I want to address myself to the issue of bias and discrimination, um, in that um, this can enhance uh, prejudices uh, in education, uh, particularly when we are using AI, obviously for decision making. These decisions are. Uh, are driven by the kind of data uh, that uh, uh, you know the AI system has used uh, to 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 provide um, uh, the chatbots and so forth to make the decisions. So are we not seeing a, uh, this bias being um, uh, uh, weighed in favor of the developed world <laughs> compared to the developing world? Uh, I'm just posing this to uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Oscar and Jude. Uh, maybe they can enlighten us uh, on, on that aspect. Thank you, and over to you, uh, uh, moderator. Okay, thank you very much. I will ask them to take note because I'll give them slots. Out of the 30 minutes, we shall use 20, and then uh, the other 10 will be shared among the two, between the two rather. Okay, thanks, George, for that. Uh, question. Okay, so Jude and um, Oscar, I think most, most of the comments in the chat room are really appreciations and also they appreciated the previous speakers before you. Uh, somebody was asking, Mark Douglas, um, I know Victor, you put up your hand just a second. Mark Douglas, Walugembe. Where does AI get the domain knowledge? Uh, then Eric Niringimana says, thank you, doctor, for the nice presentation. Is it possible to share the slides? I think Avendish University will be able to take on that. Uh, I have one suggestion question. This is Yusuf. Maybe the question will come. This is about, uh, it has not put there. Okay, the rest here in the chat room are all appreciations. Um, then I think uh, how, this is now Solomon Musa is asking how are data used by AI are outsourced and mined? So this is a technical question. How do we mine data by AI? You know, outsourcing and mining. Uh, then, uh, <laughs> Somebody has actually demonstrated the scam with uh, our chat GPT. Uh, then also, I think those are those are, are very interesting questions and comments. There's somebody called, uh, of course, the VC has already talked about that, and we have agreed. There's a question here: Can machine promote or advance values? You know, this is a, this. I think this is a, this is a very ethical. Question. Professor Mjisha, you remember when we were in, I don't know, was this in Kigali or where? Uh, one member in the conference, a similar conference, was wondering, you know, whether uh, the reverends and uh, reverend fathers and canons really can guide on the values within <laughs> the AI domain. So uh, then you are saying, what will happen to values in a machine driven world? Countries that have developed are associated with a strong value system, e.g., South Korea and Japan. Just about four weeks ago, I was in South Korea and I can tell you, I went to a smart cafe and I and, and I ordered, uh, I was served tea by a robot, you know? Uh, I made a choice 
and I went to my uh, desk and I was able to be served. It's a smart, I mean, there, there are only two people in that cafe with lots of chairs and seats and so on. So this is something that is already happening uh, and, and it's taking place. We are still behind. Okay. Um, I think the speakers, you've, you've seen that. Let's take the question. Let's take other hands. You can read through the chat to just uh, get clarification about the questions again. Uh, there is the Wilbur, uh, Wilbur and Evans Maganda. So Wilbur go first, Evans next. Okay. And then we will ask, we will ask if there are no more questions, we allow our colleagues to attempt and then we can take another set. Wilbur go first. Okay, okay, thank you. This is Wilbur Sebuyungo from Kumba University. Uh, looking at the AI, is, is there a possibility where we have AI that can actually be, be able to translate our teachers or lecturers audio into sign language automatically visualized. So because we are having uh, a few uh, sign language translators and uh, looking at inclusive AI in uh, digital education, we actually need to um, pair uh, okay. all lectures with the uh, translators, with the sign language translation. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Evans and then Victor will follow. Yes, Evans, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, first, I want to thank Oscar and uh, Professor Vega for those wonderful presentations. Uh, there is a particular part that I picked from Prof. Lubega, and I wanted to uh, get what his opinion is or how we could be able to utilize the issue of collaborations. Um, we In Africa, we tend to a little bit be, get disconnected from the rest of the globe. We are talking about these technologies. Uh, the developed countries have taken them to another level. And our priority areas, especially in developing countries, uh, either from the government or private sector, are completely also on another level. And we have seen this uh, challenge from the first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, third industrial revolution. While the rest of the world is running at a particular pace, we have always been disconnected. So. How can we, this time round, knowing that technology is a reality, AI is a reality, how could we be able to utilize uh, these collaborations uh, to make these things we are discussing uh, be affected in our local ecosystems? Yeah, because Professor Bubega has made a very good presentation. How can we make this part of the students, part of the institutions, part of the government that is making discussions about development so that uh, we can be for sure that maybe after two years, we can know either we have 100 or 200,000 uh, Ugandans who can be able to uh, utilize these tools. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Victor, please go ahead. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, And I want to thank the presenters, Oscar and Professor Lubiga. Uh, let me go straight to my question. I want to... Uh, presenter's opinion about the use of artificial intelligence, especially in uh, areas of research. Uh, in recent time, I was collaborating with one of my friends in uh, uh, one of the universities in the United States on a particular uh, research uh, uh, writing. And uh, we got to a point that uh, he made use of artificial intelligence in some aspects. And I ask, I, I told him that uh, in this part of uh, Africa, we do penalize using artificial intelligence, especially in, in writing of research. So what is your opinion? And he did, uh, that my friend told me that it depends on how you preempt your information with the use of artificial intelligence. And to my own understanding, I've seen 
that uh, in most schools, especially in Africa, do penalize students use, use, using um, AI for research purpose or for an assignment. But as it is in other uh, parts of the world, especially in, in the Western part, they encourage their students using this thing. So what is your opinion, sir? Because the way technology is going, without, we can't do, especially in aspects of research, students cannot do without use of technologies and uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I urge uh, Oscar and Jude also to look at uh, very interesting questions in the chat room, including the one of uh, <laughs> Professor Lugujo is really like saying, no way, uh, these things cannot re replace uh, the human scientists. But go ahead now, uh, Oscar and uh, Jude. Oscar, you can go first and then Jude can follow. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Prof. Mohamed. Uh, should I answer? Okay, I've, I've noted down the questions. Okay, I'll answer a few and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over back to you. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, even, even Jude can supplement. No, no problem. I think uh, one of the very first questions was about data and the bias. Yeah, and, and actually that is a very, very important question. And it is a very latent or hidden question. Because, for instance, if students are using ChatGPT, uh, if you have used ChatGPT, ChatGPT speaks to you in such a convincing way, you know, that actually you believe what it has given you, even if it is giving you a lie, you know. So, actually, uh, these tools, as much as they appear to be consolidating knowledge or summarizing it for us, actually can affect our bias. So you will find in a few years, students will be having the bias that is coming from ChatGPT. So it's important as much as we tell students, okay, you need to use, you use ChatGPT for maybe a task or something, you need to be critical about what you get, you know? So I think that's an important skill that we need to have. And, uh, and, and okay, the second question was about the digital divide. You know, the developed world have put this as one of their top agendas. And uh, I think this is very, very true as well. And uh, I mean, let, let's be honest with you that the developed world is actually paying a lot of money for AI researchers. Uh, recently, a job came out where they are paying an AI they're looking for an AI analyst at Netflix and the annual salary is $900,000. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so the developed world are intentionally focusing on this. And to be very honest, there's a very high risk that Africa is being left behind and that the digital divide will get bigger. And I'm sure just the last comment here, I'm sure you're very much aware of you know, the tensions between China and Taiwan. And uh, what's, uh, what's interesting about that is that the, the companies in Taiwan, Taiwan is the biggest producer of chips. They know that they have to get their factories out of uh, Taiwan. So they've been building factories around the world, in the US, uh, in Europe, in India, you know, but no one is building in Africa. You know, this is a sign that uh, we need to do something. We need to stand out, you know. So maybe with that, I would uh, hand over to Prof. Lubega to comment. Uh, over to you, Jude. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, 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 members that have asked uh, questions. Uh, probably I will start with the one on um, on the uh, chat uh, GBT. Uh, I must say that uh, one, we need to do a lot of uh, sensitization for both our students and staff, and then also lay guidelines that can support us in the use of uh, these uh, technologies. Uh, because what we see in the Western world, now these are accepted within their educational sector, but with a certain guidelines and policies in place. For example, I just uh, I told you that my colleague in Marymount University yesterday, indicated to me that they've allowed them and the students, one, they have to show a percentage 
of what was generated by, uh, for example, chat GPT. And the students are aware and they do this, and then they can see the percentage of what has been contributed by the student themselves. So you see, they're already moving into the direction. Within, stay within the loop as humans. So the teachers are still within the loop, but allowing the students to be able to. Don't forget that these tools are so strong and advanced that it can be able to derive different solutions so that uh, this student can be able to internalize them and come up with some very good understanding out of that, what they are learning. So I think, as uh, it was indicated, we just need to start the discussion. How are we going to do it together as institutions within the country? How is government coming in to support this? And things of that kind. The talking has to start so that we are not left behind. Okay. Um, one question was raised about uh, the collaboration. As I indicated, some of the infrastructure that needs to be installed and put in place uh, to handle some of these tools is very expensive. So this is where institutions have to come in and together say, for the good of our institutions, this is what we want. Can we come together and collaborate and have something done? So yeah, this actually, actually, Jude, that is also similar to a question raised by Bavidi Na and Teza from Mountains of the Moon University, representing the Vice Chancellor there. What are some of the technological challenges that universities may face in adopting AI? It's actually matching with that. Go ahead. Exactly, exactly. I think because it's something that is new hitting us, we just need to sit together, realize what is with us and how do we handle it uh, as a team. The business of uh, trying to walk our own journeys, I think may not lead us so far because going and buying probably is setting up a data center that is going to house this information and it requires you half a million dollars. As an institution, you may not be able to afford, but then when you come together as institutions, you can be able to live and do much. Uh, between, uh, and, and form a consortium of sort. Exactly, exactly. We already have Renew, uh, which is already supporting us. We can move into that, that direction and uh, have something uh, done. Somebody asked about a, a question that um, uh, that concerns uh, a, any solutions that can uh, support uh, that can be translated. Uh, can AI translate a lecturer's audio into video language and, and all that? I must say that already these tools are in place. We are lagging so much behind when it comes to uh, adoption of AI in our teaching and learning. These tools are out there. Uh, for example, there are some assistive technologies that are already supporting persons with disability. That as I'm speaking, there is a tool out there creating all these sign languages and a person with disability can be able to understand what I'm talking about. So these are already there. We just need to find out which ones. And there are quite many. So which one works? Unfortunately, some of them are very expensive. Very expensive. And they are not open source as, uh, as we may think. And then somebody also talked about uh, an issue um, uh, concerning um, uh, subsequent inequality, uh, where he indicated, will I be right to predict that uh, appropriators of AI knowledge will become the new capitalists or oligarchs that will control the economy? I must say they are already are. Uh, when you go to Google and see, Google is using quite a lot of AI behind it. Look at BAD as part of Google. Google. So they're already oligarchs. They are already capitalists. Anyway, until we start thinking about developing our own AI tools, then we shall continue uh, utilizing what others have given us at a cost and things of that kind. Because AI is not going away. Look at ad adaptive learning. If we are going to go into adaptive learning, many of the technologies out there are proprietary tools. They're not open source. And therefore, if we are going to really uh, integrate adaptive learning within our institutions, then we have to uh, put in some cost 
look at uh, the, the assessment tools out there that can be able to uh, that have facial recognitions in them. They are not for free and they are quite expensive, especially after the coming of COVID. They are quite expensive. So the question is, what is Africa doing? What is Uganda doing in terms of uh, leapfrogging in, in the use of these technologies? We have to get our you know, innovation incubation, in incubators working and pretty fast so that we can be able to develop solutions that are going to support us cheaply as we really are trying to catch up with the developed world. And then also somebody mentioned about um, assessments uh, being reviewed using AI. However, with privacy as a threat, how do we control plagiarism? As I said, Tanitin, for example, has already uh, developed uh, plugins uh, that can be able to detect uh, AI uh, content that has been uh, uh, put in by the students. So the tools are already there, but costly. Those of you who are using Tanitin, you're already good to go. But how many people can afford the license of Tanitin uh, in the country here? So many of the open source plagiarism software cannot be able to detect this. I just want to give you an example. Uh, that it has become, it's going beyond us. I have a student who brought me a proposal to assess. And I looked at it. Immediately, I noted that this is a chap uh, GPT uh, generated. I told him, why are you using AI to generate for me a proposal? Can't you use your brain? Then he laughed. Then I say, I told him, you see, I chased him away. You can develop your own. So he went back and got another AI. AI tool dumped in the proposal, and then the AI tool was able to generate a student related sort of language or writing and it brought back the proposal to me. It looked okay to me. But then he laughed and told me, Do you know what I did? I just went to another tool called ABCD, dumped in the proposal. It was able to generate for me another uh, proposal, the one you are looking at. It's amazing what is happening. But they are here with us. We either move fast, all, all our jobs at a risk. But as Professor Lugujo said, we need to keep the human in the loop. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I noticed there are some very technical questions, like the one from Orutayo Osunsan. I think this is really some kind of tough for the non-computer scientists, uh, if you check in the chat room, what's your view on the level of AI technology with regards to the Turing test imitation game that suggests that AI passes has a human when interrogated in text-based conversation? Are there reverse innovations in the AI space, specifically originating from Africa? Jude, can you take on that? Or Oscar, I don't know. Yeah, I go first. So, sorry, I just wanted to contribute a little bit on what Jude said before. You know, there's an interesting thing about uh, universities investing in technology. And my view is that actually universities don't invest enough. And it's very easy to test this, is to go back, when you go back to your office, look at what percentage of your uh, investment, well, your overall revenue what percentage of it do you spend on technology, you know? And, and you know, we have, I know we're very keen sometimes to, to get the latest technology, but when we look at our, our investments, unfortunately, they are quite low. Uh, I just wanted to answer one question about the, the how the, the domain knowledge is acquired. I'm going in for now. Sorry. Hi, Radia. MC, can you silence those okay. people, please? Yeah, Oscar, go ahead. One question on the uh, how the knowledge base is built. You know, I just, uh, we didn't quite answer that one. But what I just wanted to highlight is that, uh, you know, traditionally the knowledge bases were built with expert systems. So you would take experts and you would get their knowledge out and you'd put it into a system. But, uh, but today what you do is, you simply put the data in the machine, the machine figures out the rules. And a very good example of that is actually language translation. 
in the 90s, you would uh, look at all the grammar, and then based on the grammar, you would try to uh, put in all the grammar rules into a system. And then, so every language you had to like learn all the grammar before it could learn. Now what you do to learn a language is you simply put all the text, all the free text you can find, the machine figures out the grammar, and then the next thing it's able to speak the language, you know, at least to, to, you know, to summarize the language, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, Chair, if you'll allow me, there was one question on values we didn't quite complete. I thought it's also important to just uh, mention that. And I think, uh, you know, I, in my view, computers will never, or technology will never embody values. But what needs to happen is that as humans, we need to work side by side with the machines. Yeah, it's not really about the machines replacing the people or the people replacing the machines. It's about working together. You know, it's a little bit like the calculator. Uh, when the calculator first came in, people thought, oh, we're going to get lazy. We're not, uh, you know, and there's still that debate going on in some places where the students should or should not use a calculator. But we've seen it doesn't take over jobs. Yeah, actually, it supplements and makes our work uh, much, much uh, easier. Yeah. And one of my best examples of what you don't do with uh, ChatGPT is you do not learn how to drive on ChatGPT. Okay. And a number of people have heard this example from me before. You cannot learn to drive a car on ChatGPT. Yeah. So there's things that ChatGPT can't do at all. You know, you cannot learn a skill on ChatGPT. Yeah. And, and this is what's very important for for you know for our institutions to be able to distinguish what is knowledge and what is skill you know and, and many times today in the workplace the employers are also looking for skill okay knowledge is kind of the basis for the skill but at the end of the day the employer wants an output you know so i just wanted to add that uh chair Okay, thank you very much. I think our session is almost coming to an end. Uh, yeah, can, I, can I just yeah. say one small thing? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Jude, Jude also answer this question, which has been sent directly to my inbox. Somebody is saying, uh, does the National Council for Higher Education have the capacity to set standards for higher education institutions regarding the use of AI? Are there any standard guidelines for universities and how do we deal with this? Because universities are, are moving, may move faster and there are for be caught in the context of non-compliance. Uh, thank you. I'll start with that question. And I, I must say that uh, the country has capacity, uh, already people knowledgeable in the area. So it's a matter of bringing those people together so that they can help National Council put together policy guidelines that can support it. I think that's the better way to, uh, to do it. And then also benchmark from what other universities have been able to do. So not reinventing the wheel, uh, but trying to see the good practice out there and then try to put uh, guidelines that can support the country. For me, I think that's the direction we need to take and very fast because it's already here with us. As somebody talked about, um, uh, if AI is promoted, then what becomes the real human intelligence? I just wanted to bring it uh, to bring a, a real scenario that happened uh, last month in one of uh, the countries where they had the first robot in the world to lead a church service. I think you heard about it. Now. This is even providing summons and all that. It was amazing that in front of them was a robot which led the entire church service. So that means you don't need a priest, you don't need a, a canon, you don't need uh, a sheikh or whatever. This can be done. So the question is... So, so, so what happened to the clergy then? Do they also become participants uh, in the service or what? how do they guide this robot in case, uh, you know, there are issues because it's programmed to deliver a certain message? Exactly. And this is what we are thinking about today is that once we give all these powers, all this knowledge to the robots, where is the human in the room? We have to remain in the loop because we are going to give all the knowledge 
It can study the entire Quran. It can study the entire Bible. It can be in the education institution. It can study the entire computing field, networks, uh, machine learning, all. So that when they go into the class and the student poses a question, they will be able to answer the question without any and provide as much examples as possible. That is where we are going. Those are the teachers we are going to have within our classrooms. And there will be more, there will be brighter teachers than we are. Mm. This is the fact. Because the moment it's built to do that, it will be able to deliver on the cause. But there is always one switch. The person out there can simply switch it off and falls in the class dead. Let's leave the human in the room. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, members. Uh, and the, 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 the conversation is continuing in the chat room. We are still here. I'm about to expire my tenure. First of all, I want to say that uh, AI was invented by the human mind and human intelligence. And therefore, I think uh, the human intelligence can still uh, surpass or take charge. Of course, there are consequences that may be uh, irreversible because of our own human actions, but that's the actual reason why we have universities uh, when we are challenged, we should invest and engage much more in research, innovation, try to circumvent any consequences of the new technologies. And I think this is something that is very good. And I want to thank Cavendish University for creating this space for us to deliberate. I want to end here and thank you for being an, such an excellent uh, audience. And uh, over to you back, MC and I'll be uh, in the participants as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, for moderating a very lively and informative session. As I had asked earlier on, that uh, we could have Dr. Olive's presentation roll over into the next session that will be moderated by Prof. Nasinyama. Uh, but before we come to that, there was a suggestion, which I think is appropriate, that we could have a five minute health break. If uh, members allow, we could have that health break and then return at, uh, at five minutes to midday to proceed from there with the session that will be chaired by Prof. George Nasinyama, who will introduce before he starts. Thank you. Our uh, dear guests, I would like to welcome you back from the previous session, which was uh, the break that we agreed upon, and to also welcome you to the new session that is going to be chaired by Professor George Nasinyama, the Vice Chancellor of UNICAF University in Uganda. But before I do so, I should like to thank very much the previous chair, Professor Mohamed Pezimhigo, the vice chancellor of Kampala International University in Uganda, and the presenters, Dr. Oscar Correa, as well as Professor Jude Luega of Nkumba University. I have the pleasure of introducing the next session chair, Professor George Nasinyama, the Vice Chancellor of UNICAF University, Uganda, who previously served as Kampala International University's Deputy Chance Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Extension. And prior to that, he had held several positions, including head of department, where he made several contributions to the world of research, stretching back to his days at Makerere University, um, having served as the Deputy Director for Research and Publications. There, he coordinated the writing and management of large research grants in support of faculty research and postgraduate and postdoctoral training. He worked to help, he, he, he worked to keep 
Makerere University in the top echelons of global research and to accomplish several collaborations and partnerships with international universities and research institutions. He is also a veterinarian by profession, an epidemiologist by training, and a veterinary public health and preventive med medicine specialist with a keen interest in global health. He has authored more than 50 articles in international, internationally accredited journals, books and book chapters, and is an external examiner for many universities in the region and internationally, as well as a reviewer of many peer-reviewed journals. So as I introduce Professor George Nasinyama, I would also like to take the same privilege to introduce the next presenter, who is my colleague at Cavendish University, Uganda, Dr. Olive Sabiti. Dr. Olive Sabiti serves at Cavendish University, Uganda as the Deputy Vice Chancellor and is a lawyer by training and practice being an advocate of the High Court of Uganda, a member of the Uganda Law Society, the East African Law Society, and the Society for Institutional and Organizational Economics. He's a board, she is a board member of the Research and Education Network for Uganda, RENU as it's called, and I believe a number of institutions constituting the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum are members of that network. Dr. Olive Sabiti also represents Cavendish University Uganda, the International Association of Law Schools. She has been a Dean of the Faculty of Law at Cavendish University Uganda. She has also been a lecturer of law at the University of Manchester, Makerere University, Uganda Christian University in Kono, Uganda Management Institute. And interestingly enough, she had a delve into the realm of politics as a speaker of PG District Council. Today, that would be the part uh, constituting Gomba District, where she hailed. During that time, she chaired the Association of All District Council Speakers in Uganda, and was also chair of the Conflict Resolution Committee of the Uganda Local Governments Association, ULGA as it's called. Dr. Oliver has got a PhD in law from the University of Manchester, a Master of Laws in International Business Law from the University of Manchester, a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the legal, from the Law Development Center, and a Bachelor of Laws degree from Makerere University. With, she has also been a Commonwealth Scholar, a British Cheven Scholar. All these are very prestigious scholarships. Um, that Dr. Olive has been able to utilize and be ready to present to us today. So I hand over back to the session chair, Professor Nasinyama, to take us from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, David. And uh, I want to welcome all the participants. Um, I've been introduced as uh, the Vice Chancellor of UNICAF University. Uh, maybe those who don't know about UNICAF University is a relatively new entrant in the higher education landscape of Uganda. Although UNICAF as an organization has been around offering online degree programs for over 30 years. Uh, um, I'm uh, delighted to be part of this very important conference uh, which is discussing a very critical and key area, uh, like um, Professor Katunguka highlighted. Uh, of course, thanks to the ED, Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, Professor Blue Bujo, uh, where I'm a member of the Research and Development Committee. And of course, uh, Professor John Francis Mugisha, the VC of Cavendish University, for indeed organizing this very timely conference. Uh, I indeed appreciate the remarks of Professor Katunguka calling upon the government uh, to place artificial intelligence as a priority on its uh, agenda, uh, given the 
and that's of course benefits, but also the downside of it as we've had. Um, of course, the potential of AI, especially generative AI, is topical. We've uh, been introduced to that and is indeed uh, disrupting many spheres of life as we know it, including, of course, higher education and learning, which is the focus of today's conference. It is no longer in the sci-fi or alien movies, but becoming in integral to our way of life. Uh, therefore, I'm happy to chair this uh, particular session where we'll have, um, uh, uh, I think, two presentations. I don't know about the third. Do we have uh, Dr. Hamis Pugendawala with us? Um, oh, we don't have that one today. Okay, so we have two uh, presenters during this session uh, by notable persons uh, to help us understand uh, the ethical issues. I hope uh, Professor um, uh, John Mugisha, is he going to highlight some of this or we leave that to the uh, to discuss them based on what has been uh, provided so far. Arising from AI in higher education institutions, um, um, I'll be guided by uh, uh, Mr. Muta, Muta Nura. Mutavanura uh, uh, on that aspect as well. Uh, without uh, taking more time, um, let me invite um, Dr. Olive Sabiti, who has been ably introduced, uh, to give us a presentation uh, to be able to discuss uh, techniques of assessment uh, that are not amenable to artificial intelligence. Knowing that um, assessments in uh, Higher education uh, always um, an an issue uh, of discussion of um, uh, improvements, continuous improvements, and particularly in this era of online learning. Um, and um, uh, how do we leverage artificial intelligence or not leverage it in uh, in uh, in aspects of assessment? Let's hear from uh, uh, Dr. Olive Sabiti. Uh, you are welcome, uh, Dr. Sabiti. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasinyama, for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, I'm going to, to go right in to discuss uh, the techniques that are not amenable to artificial intelligence assessment techniques. And please allow me to share my screen. It is interesting because everyone discussing artificial intelligence and the disruptions that it has caused to higher education institutions. We are saying now that artificial intelligence is here, what is going to happen to institutions, to assessment? In fact, Professor Lubega amused us when he mentioned that our chapter GPT led a chat service. And what I did, I quickly typed in a prayer. I told chat GPT, can you pray with me for a successful presentation? And chat GPT wrote an excellent prayer, including that I get blessings for a successful presentation that engages and enlightens my audience. Assessment is not just a way of achieving credentials or giving them, but it is also to encourage students' growth as well as and I say that really because uh, of assessment so many
Aquaman. Screening, diagnostic, formative, and summative. Screening, like what usually happens at the low development center, when they try to see which students are suitable for the back course. Diagnostic, like what any lecturer would do when you want to assess the skill that your learners have at the beginning of a session. Formative, I would say, is more like our coursework when we, which is ongoing, it's ongoing assessment. And it may also be informal, not always, but may also be informal. And then summative assessment, of course, which we all know, which happens in at the end of the semester in higher education institutions and students end up with a grade. But there is another aspect of assessment that is taking center stage and that is self and peer assessment because research has shown that these kinds of assessment are critical in ensuring motivation and engagement for the learners. I have mentioned before that we don't necessarily assess only for credentialing. So why do we assess? We assess for a number of reasons and those reasons cut across different stakeholders. We assess for a different reason when it is learners and instructors because of course we want to diagnose, we want to motivate, we want to give feedback. We want to increase students' effectiveness and efficiency, self-efficacy, but then the education system would also want us to assess for different reasons, like the National Council for Higher Education may be interested in quality control, like the Ministry of Education, and of course, certification also falls in there. And then, of course, we can also assess for curriculum course design, for accountability, and to monitor effectiveness. We are always advised as educators to bear in mind the assessment framework in higher education, to remember that there are many different tasks that we can use. You can see very many different verbs that are highlighted. So we can use different tasks depending on what purpose of assessment we are considering. And I can say right now that if you assess using the descriptive task, then of course, those ones, your, the students are just going to run to artificial intelligence. They're just going to run to chat GPT because you're telling them to describe, but that there are very many other tasks that we can give our students that fulfill all the requirements of um, a good assessment. They are reliable, they are authentic, they are valid, they are reusable, they satisfy a, a wide range of stakeholders, and they also have the right educational motivations. And yet you may not be trapped by chat GPT. We have heard in the first presentations that artificial intelligence is here with us and it has also dominated higher education institutions. We have it applying in very many ways uh, now you have a virtual facilitator, you've seen all these MOOCs, the massive open online courses. It can automatically grade at Cavendish, our learning platform automatically grades students. We can just, students can, after the end of each week, they go onto the platform and the platform can automatically grade them. But of course, that is a formative kind of assessment to help them improve their learning. Chatbots, artificial intelligence is also helpful in personalized learning. So proctor exams, because we're talking about assessment. When we get, um, when, we, when we are very preoccupied with detection and deterrence and cheating, then artificial intelligence can also proctor our exams. And these benefits, which have called goals for AI, have also been talked about by the other presenters. So I will not go back into them. 
reduced costs, increased outcomes, and so forth, so on and so forth. But what is important for us today, really, is the challenges and considerations of, of AI in assessment. Because those challenges of AI lead us to those assessments that are not amenable to artificial intelligence. And I came across an article, uh, I think it was from Wiley, where someone was, the title of the article is right there, it was saying artificial intelligence in educational assessment. Is it a breakthrough? Or is it bankham? Or is it ballyhoo? So basically meaning, is it just hyperbole? Are people just, you know, hyping nothing? That is also out there. But there are other challenges. Of course, that is food for thought. But there's a challenge of bias and fairness, especially when we talk from Africa. I remember I used chat GPT um, to give me the word thank you in different languages at a certain workshop. I think it was in Zambia. And it gave me wrong, wrong, wrong things. So here I was, I had posted on my PowerPoint slide, thank you in different languages and they were wrong. And it is because in, in, in mining the data, in compiling the data, they are kind of skewed in favor of the developed West. They try to also include that data, but there's that bias, there's that skew. So it gave me the wrong things. But there are privacy concerns. Once we post something in chat GPT, it becomes public. It is inside there, it's part of their data. Chat GPT definitely lacks a human touch. We talk about emotional intelligence. Chat GPT is unable to navigate that. It is not able to replicate emotional intelligence. It cannot provide mentorship. It cannot inspire. It cannot give us emotional support. Uh, Professor Jude was talking about inclusivity and he mentioned people who are blind. But I can also talk about people who are mentally ill. Chat GPT would not tell that these people are mentally ill and will not be in position to emulate sympathy, empathy, and appropriate counseling. We've talked about complex assessments and we think that chat GPT is here to outjob us. We will be out of jobs because what will we do if chat GPT is bringing all these assessments? But the good news is chat GPT is unable, it struggles when it comes to assessing complex nuanced skills. It is challenging when it comes to creativity, to critical thinking, because sometimes these things are contextual and it's not able to do that successfully. But of course, over-reliance on technology, when we excessively rely on artificial intelligence, then we may lack that human touch. We lack personalized feedback in education. Instead of going to your professor, asking him a question, discussing it, you now go to chat GPT. For example, on my desktop, chat GPT is always open 24 seven, even when I sleep. But then you miss that personal touch. And the other challenge is that this artificial intelligence needs continuous update, continuous development and maintenance. Uh, you've seen that chat GPT warns us that they, they have knowledge up to 2021. So sometimes if you ask it, uh, I was doing some work on the East African community recently. And so I asked, asked it about the East African community and the members, and it talked about six members. So what happened after, after 2021? It does not know. That is a challenge. However, something that has come up very interestingly, all the presenters before me have argued that we should not be removed from artificial intelligence. They've argued that we need to collaborate, we need to have that synergy between artificial intelligence and human beings. In any case, we are looking forward to the fifth industrial revolution where robotics is going to take over. So having seen those challenges of chat GPT, 
How do we respond? What can we do as educators? And the first thing that comes to our mind, you know what? Let us revert. You close them three hours and we think about why you assess the problem. I that with um COVID nineteen we all ushered on two on phones. And I I also like the quote that says that a mind, a mind that has been stretched beyond its dimensions may never return to its old dimension. The man's mind, when stretched to new ideas, may not return to old dimensions. So we cannot return to those dimensions. So one option is to revert, to concentrate on detection and deterrence. People are not cheating, turn it in. And mind you, even turn it in, it, is, it, it, uh, it makes economic sense, even turn it in, may be interested in making us very worried of plagiarism because that's their business. When we're worried of plagiarism, you have to kind of support a system whereby you, you, you detect plagiarism and so on and so forth. What then is a better way? The better way would be to embrace artificial intelligence, to ask our students to use it not to shy away from it. So I like the uh, examples of universities that have been talked about, where it is integrated in learning. At Cavendish University, Uganda, at our students' orientation, we introduce them to chat GPT, even those who did not know about it. So we can embrace it. Be clear as an instructor, tell students, go to chat GPT and generate an answer on ABC. After that, ask them to critique that answer. Ask them to improve that answer. Ask them to give you references. Remember, chat GPT contains, can, can hallucinate sometimes, so it can even give you made up um, citations, references. And this is, you're training the students to be alert to all these. So that is one way. That's a second way to embrace to allow our students to use these artificial intelligence tools and maybe to show their track changes, what changes they have made and why. But we can take the third, the third way, which is called to outrun, to outrun artificial intelligence, you know, to seek those assessment types that are not amenable to chat to artificial intelligence that are not amenable to, that are beyond the reach of artificial intelligence. And here, I would like to talk about shifting assessments from product to process. Why do we emphasize on the mark that a student is going to give you? Why do you emphasize on the output, the essay that a student is going to submit? What if you become more interested in the process? How did they come up with that topic if it's a research? What are the processes they went through? How did they choose their, their references? How did they decide to structure their essay in a given way? How did they come up with a particular product if it's in innovations? So we need to include process in assessment. We need to process. We, made, we need to make the process visible to the assessor. And we need the students to work as teams. When students work as teams, then they are the, the, there is that accountability. We can also assess our learners on soft skills and emotional intelligence, on interpersonal abilities. After all, Theodore Roosevelt has said that the most important single ingredient, the most important single ingredient in the formula of success is knowing how to get along with people. So if that is a single most formula, single most important formula for success. Why don't we train our learners? AI, of course, I've said that before, it struggles. It cannot manage dispute resolution. It cannot detect people's nuances. We can also think 
carefully about the assessment format that we give. We can use paywall text. Those are texts where you need to pay to access them because these, some of these materials are not available on these artificial intelligence platforms. Let us make our assessments multimodal. Why do you always give the essay? Ask them to make a PowerPoint. Ask them to record a video. Include text and image. It will be more difficult for the students and yet you'll be equipping them with, with skills. We could assess real-time performance, like what happens in Vivas. We could also take on portfolio assessments. That is what I've called longitudinal assessments. And we could also think of dialogic assessments where you interact with the Olive, learners. Olive, yes, you, have, you, you have four minutes more. Okay, thank you. We can also design questions or tasks which cannot be answered by artificial intelligence. But we need to remember that artificial intelligence is also evolving very rapidly. We need to focus on the forms of knowledge assessed. At Cavendish University of Uganda, we emphasize higher order thinking in our assessment. Because if it's higher order thinking, if it's targeting, evaluating, create, creating, it may be a bit difficult for the chatbot or for artificial intelligence. And also personalized knowledge. Although when you ask it, instead of asking a question which is general, you can say maybe specific to students of a given university, specific to a given regional er geographical area. Although this can be uh, maneuvered by using, by feeding, prompting, chat GPT or prompting whatever artificial intelligence you're using with lots more information. Prompt engineering is also a critical factor. Creativity and innovate and originality, it is not very good. Like if you're dealing with fashion design, art, architecture, it may not be very good. Engage in complex problem solving, ethical and moral judgment. This has been talked about before. Because education without values, as useful as it is, it seems rather to make a man a more clever devil. Is that what we want, to make people more clever devils? So we need, when we want, um, as, when we want our students, our learners to be, to develop ethical standpoints, we need to, we can give them those assessments and chat GPT may not be very useful at that or other artificial intelligence. I've talked about emotional intelligence, personal interviews, of course, or examinations. These are not accessible. Subjective assessments, we know that these may not be amenable to artificial intelligence. One key, that, one key um, aspect that I would like to talk about as I close are the programmatic assessments, programmatic, authentic, and future-oriented assessments. Programmatic assessments are kind of more to do with assessment for learning but they assess a whole wide dimension of skills, competencies, and attitudes. So when we incorporate multiple assessment formats and we target a range of different kinds of knowledge, then as artificial intelligence is unable to capture that learning, it's unable to replicate the skill that we want. So programmatic assessment. The second one is authentic assessment. Authentic assessments are assessments that mimic the world of work, real life, they mimic real life. Now, these are also very good. Look for assessments that mimic challenges in industry, that mimic challenges at universities, and we will be able to, these will not be amenable to artificial intelligence. And future focused or sustainable assessments, these are the these are assessments that aim at equipping learners with the skills, the knowledge, and the attitudes that they need beyond graduation, because we don't know what jobs will be available, but we can equip them with the skills that they will need. Future focus assessment can help students understand how they might, how they might learn to work, even with new technologies 
uh, and artificial intelligence. I am concluding that while artificial intelligence continues to advance, assessment techniques may still benefit from human expertise, judgment, and contextual understanding. So I advocate for a hybrid approach, a blended approach that combines artificial intelligence driven analysis with human judgment and interpretation to offer the most effective and comprehensive assessment strategy. The value of human judgment, intuition, creativity, and all that are what point us to at, uh, what point us to assessments beyond artificial intelligence and the synergy between man and artificial intelligence in assessment is, is key. Remember that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. We are supposed to trigger our learners to become critical thinkers and to develop that in their assessments. I thank you so very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Olive Sabiti, um, uh, for that quite uh, um, intricate and interesting um, uh, discussion on uh, the area of assessment um, and highlighting the, the challenges, the areas that um, AI may be able uh, Universities, of course, universities have been. Um, have, uh, yeah. We are always we, as we do evolve. I will give you an example. Recently, we had um, an essay competition uh, um, for senior six, uh, the current senior six students. It was a nation, a nationwide competition on reimagining Uganda a journey through uh, Uganda's awesome landscape, a journey uh, uh, through Uganda's awesome uh, landscape. So we are focusing on tourism because tourism is one of the uh, forex, big forex earners for this country. And I, I, I tell you the truth that um, a number of students um, uh, uh, used uh, chat GPT 3.5 and you could see that. Uh, what and, and how did we know that uh, when we assessed this, we received over um, uh, 80, 80 submissions from all over the country. And uh, uh, the, that personal touch, you can if you don't see that personal touch um, in uh, in uh, in these essays, uh, that is one uh, flag that this could be coming from uh, somewhere. Um, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sabiti, uh, for walking us through uh, the various types of assessments, of course, the formative and summative assessments uh, common in our universities, but we need to be always um, alive um, uh, to the challenges that have come in with the chat GPT. Now that we have chat GPT 4.0, uh, which is a bit more advanced than uh, at GPT 3.5. So colleagues, um, there are some um, comments which have come in the chat. Um, uh, uh, you know, someone is um, agreeing with you with the critical thinking uh, in our students. Um, uh, uh, they, let me see. Uh, others agreeing with you mainly. Um, I, uh, I'm just going through them before I can open it up. Um, um, they are just uh, comments supporting uh, the assessment areas that you have uh, highlighted. Uh, uh, they're thanking you for this very enlightening presentation. Okay, cobotics is the way to uh, the way forward. 
Um, anyone, um, do we have any people who would like to have a physical uh, questions? I don't see any in the chat. They have all been comments which are uh, uh, supportive of um, what Dr. Sabit has uh, indeed presented. Do you have any other questions? I don't see any hands up. Yes, um, I see one hand from uh, Umar Yahya. Yahya, Yahya, Yahya. Please unmute and uh, ask your question. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Prof. George, for the opportunity. And uh, many thanks to Dr. Olive for that uh, passionate presentation. I, I had wanted to make this contribution in the previous one, but I realized mm. it's more, uh, it quite fits into this presentation since it is about having institutional readiness in this age of uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say, as someone clearly said in the earlier session, that throughout the history of revolutions, all the industrial revolutions, much of Africa has been lagging and we've been at the consumer level mainly. We've not participated at the production level. Mm. And that has largely uh, made us people who have uh, less options when it comes to utilizing utilization of these technologies. Uh, those who didn't participate in the, in, in the mechanical bit of the revolution, could only buy the, the, the machines. Those who didn't participate in the electronics one, the same. Now you have the digital. Mm. You can actually see that the, the, the emotions and the fears around this discussion that we're having today, an important one, are all at the application level. And thanks to these generative AIs, they have given us a huge scale. I think unless and until people feel that, well, my routine is threatened, we are not going to wake up, right? So my contribution against that background, since there are several vice chancellors of the various universities in this discussion, I would like to take this opportunity to propose uh, two things in line with this. One, each institution of learning, as we know, higher institutions of learning are, are a bigger stake, are a big stakeholder in, uh, in, in formulating national regulations and the way things work out nationally, uh, globally, not only in Uganda. Each institution of higher learning ought to have what you would call a center for innovative teaching and learning. So this is supposed to take care of all these disrupt, disruptive technologies that are popping up. We're only talking about generative AIs, these large language models like chat GPT, but you've had virtual reality around for some time. It's also a disruption, but not, not, not to the same scale. It has application areas in teaching and learning. But that we paid a deaf ear to that because it was not this much as care. But if we have a center for innovative teaching and learning in every institution, it would take care of these dynamic uh, disruptive technologies that are coming Thank up you. to yeah. the benefit of teaching and learning. Thank you. Then second point. Do you, you have another one? Okay, please, yes. one minute. Eh? Yes, those are the, uh, proposing two things. The second point is about uh, building the core human capital of the country. Universities, we have not paid attention to this aspect. We are discussing about the application of AI, using AI applications rather. What about building these AI systems? What is our core contribution? So I would like to think that as higher institutions of learning, 
we need to take part at the production level. And part of this requires building the core expertise in these disruptive technologies uh, where artificial intelligence uh, falls. So I would like to uh, say that we should, yes, we have to be disruptive in our uh, interventions, but we have to look at uh, fundamental issues that will help us build institutional readiness, both in the medium and long term. I submit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, thank you for that proposition. Of course, uh, we'll, uh, this will be considered uh, uh, as uh, actionable points from this conference. Um, I'm told we have another presentation to come, um, then we can have the discussions. I've been advised uh, that uh, we finish the presentation and then we can go um, on to the discussion. Just keep, keep those uh, uh, questions um uh, uh, until we finish the next presentation um thank you um uh, david uh, please can you introduce the next uh, presenter please yes with great pleasure um i would like to introduce the next presenter professor bailey damti the vice chancellor kepler college in rwanda uh, you are, you are, you are, you are, you, we have a wrong, uh, uh, what was uh, presented on the screen is uh, for a, another person. Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, we have uh, Professor Bailey, yes. So we have Professor Bailey coming, coming to make his presentation. He's the Vice Chancellor of Kepler College in Rwanda. Uh, amongst others, he is the vice chairman and incoming chairman of the East African Hub of the Education Collaborative, a pan-African network of higher learning institutions that seek to deepen collaboration with the aim of raising student learning outcomes in employability, entrepreneurship, ethical uh, leadership, and communities through mentorship, support, and building centers of excellence. I must say Cavendish University of Uganda is a member of the Education Collaborative. And also, I should be pleased to announce that as of this week, Mbarara University of Science and Technology has joined as a member. But going back to Professor uh, Bailey, Professor Bailey has got a PhD in space physics from the University of Oulu in Finland, a master's degree in space physics from the Arctic University of Norway, and a Bachelor of Science in, uh, in Physics from the Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. He's a well-regarded scientific researcher and academician. He's also a founder and an entrepreneur, uh, somebody that has offered more than 20 years of experience in higher education leadership and management, research, community outreach, and teaching, and been specifically uh, involved in getting Kepler College in Rwanda to be accredited and also in uh, involved in the development and operationalization of Kepler's graduate employment program in Rwanda and Ethiopia. Before that, he was at, uh, he was the president of Bahir Dai University in Ethiopia from 2011 to 2018, a period of seven years during which time he initiated and successfully led the transformation of the university to become a major research university in the region, including the establishment of a new medical college, a maritime academy, and, and an unprecedented graduate and research expansion program. He has uh, he raised that university enrollment to well over 80,000 uh, students. Uh, and as a founder, he, he started the Washera Geospace and Radar at Bahirda University, which is a leading space physics research center in the East African region. Beyond the education collaborative that I mentioned earlier on, he has served as a board member of several federal and regional governments and non-governmental institutions in Ethiopia and elsewhere. Um, and I believe he has presented on this subject before on a number of occasions, including at the Inter-University Council for East Africa. So this is the person that will be presenting to us shortly, and I hand over back to you, Chair, 
uh, for further direction. Thank you so much, um, uh, David. Uh, let's welcome uh, Professor uh, uh, Bailey from uh, Kepler University uh, in Rwanda, is the Vice Chancellor. Um, please, without much ado, uh, I hand over to you to talk to us. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity. I think uh, first uh, I want to uh, say uh, uh, thank you for uh, Cavendish team, <laughs> Professor Mugesha for inviting me. Is it me or? No, I think we lost him. That's correct. Um, I have readmitted okay, so... him, so I think he's joining again. I've just okay. admitted him. Thank you. Professor Bailey, in the event you you think you are you are presenting to us, we are able to see your screen, but we can't hear your voice. He's still muted. Sorry. Yeah. Please unmute. Sorry. Sorry about that. So, can you see now the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. Sorry about that. So, first of all, but I really thank you, you Professor Mugisha. Is it possible for, to is it possible to to put on full presentation? Yes. The screen is. Uh, so, sorry. Yes, that's better. Please okay. proceed. Okay. Thank you very much. So first of all, I want to thank Professor Mugesha and his team, David Olive, for inviting me uh, to share uh, this presentation with you. Uh, I must say that. Uh, the team is very dynamic and I had numerous discussion, very uh, deep discussion on this issue and many other uh, areas. And I learned a lot from the team. So thank you very much for uh, the, an excellent relationship that we have. And I am looking forward to learn more uh, as we move forward from all of you uh, today in this uh, discussion. So that's uh, really thank you very much. So number two, I want to give just few, I want to say few things the way I want to approach this presentation. Number one, uh, I think that a, a very uh, well-founded technical definition of AI has been given, but I want to offer an operational definition that I uh, we use here, we like to use here from a higher education perspective, what is AI about? We, uh, for practical purpose, we want to think AI as a tool, a new tool that gives a lots of opportunity to our challenges. Mm. But this tool is based on uh, a fundamental things called data and also other things called mathematics, statistics, and programming. So these are like a branch. So I want AI is a tool. So in my presentation, AI is a tool like any other tool, mobile phone or tractors or anything. It is a tool that has been created to assist human to do things better. So that's the, the definition I'm going to use. So in analogy, like minerals are used to do machine, mobile phones and so on. Data is equivalent to minerals. And the machine that we see tractors and mobile phones are kind of equivalent to AI tools. With that, then I will ask the fundamental questions in higher education. I will move to that. What is the fundamental question we have in higher education that this AI tool may help us to solve? So basically we have three questions that we are asking in higher education. I will come to the detail. First one is that we are challenged by the quality of education as measured by learning outcome and employment outcome. So is there an opportunity in using AI tools to transform that outcome? 
That's like one way of seeing it. And then another is that the cost of higher education is becoming very, very uh, expensive. Can AI tool be helpful in terms of reducing the cost and making higher education affordable? That is the second question. And the third question is really about access to higher education. In, in our region, as you all know, roughly 10% of you know, the uh, uh, you know, access rate is 10%, where in some countries, advanced economies, if I remember correctly, higher than 40%. So these are the fundamental questions I would like to ask. So the objective of my presentation is that just to highlight some of the potential of AI in terms of really providing solution to this big problem I just mentioned. And then I will say a few things about its challenge. So let's say the fundamental, let's continue. I am going to continue now to share with you the, the fundamental question. So the foundation question. So basically, what should a student learn? I think that we are constantly asking this question and Dr. Olive has presented in a very nice way through her assessment tools, she told us what the students should learn. So I will not go into detail, but you know, as technology progress, ability to retrieve and knowledge quickly and apply to solve problem is going to be increasingly important. Transferable skill is going to be increasingly important. Future-proof skills, as uh, Dr. Olive was mentioning some of them, is very going to be very important. And then also we are constantly asking ourselves, how do students learn actually? Is it by doing? Is it by self-paced learning? Will this AI tool provide a new way of uh, really for effective measure? And then of course, Dr. Olive also go in detail about assessment. So these are the questions that we ask if AI can provide a solution. And then we, are, we also ask a question about you know, I think many presenters have shared to us, student admission, teaching and learning, how should we provide efficient academic service that is satisfactory to the student, to the customer, and it's not, it is cost effective to us. And then also research these days, many, many of our researchers spend a lot of significant time reviewing all these different uh, papers. Could AI provide a very quick snapshot of the background research that has been done before very quickly so that our researcher can very quickly summarize what has been done so far and what the, the new innovation should be about? Is there a way to do it? Similarly, in management, in performance management, is there a tool that we can quickly use to assess our performance, human resource management, and so on, and including property administration and finance uh, uh, administration. So from the fundamental aspect, these are the questions that we are really using to, uh, to really come to the AI. I don't, uh, the approach of coming from AI to higher education, I think that will a, a little bit make our approach much more defocused. So just coming from our challenge might be a, a best approach. So. The potential, of course, some of the presenter has highlighted this, the significant cost in higher education, especially the teacher, both in terms of their working hours and in terms of also their motivation is assessment. I think that AI tools for all these different assessment, AI tools has been proven to support successfully as this uh, study demonstrate to take over the extensive load the teacher are spending on assessment. And instead they spend on interaction with the student in a meaningful way so that learning outcome can be, be improved and that the machine can do it. I think this is the area that we can look at. This means we, we save cost and we increase motivation of the teacher. And the other is like, it has been mentioned, I don't want to spend too much time on this, personalized learning, test assessment, language learning, which has been already mentioned. So I don't want to go into detail, but I think the last one, AI power tailor-made upskilling and training program, 
is really an, an increasing uh, trend now. So for students here, I classify based on a couple of like target population. For students, uh, these are the things, personalized learning, transformed education outcomes through personalized learning, rich and easily accessible academic resource, and also tools for learning. The student can benefit from this. And the teacher, I think we, it's a really, really significant. All of you who has been a teacher, I was a teacher for many years and still having PhD student. I think assessment, when you have a lot of students in the class, is the hardest job to do and give quick feedback. Feedback is critical for learning. So decreasing loads is great potential. And also teacher constant development in terms of new approach learning, it can transform. And also for administrator, uh, this uh, facility can provide. Now I want to have two slides only. Uh, I see the our leader seeing his clock. So I want to say like two slides here, a practical step as an institution. I am also here as a leader of an institution that we are thinking. I think the first critical, critical part of the equation is collecting and owning data. Right now, all the, our data are in the cloud. If we consider Google, for example, all Google computers, maybe they have now in South Africa, other than that, there is no cloud supported computer or data storage center cloud services of, of Google in Africa. They are located elsewhere. Are we going to really trust this virtual machine, locate, uh, real machine located somewhere else that we can access remotely and use their tools, which is owned by somebody, the hardware is owned by somebody, and develop a tool and transform our learning based on that tool, owned by entirely outside the continent? The critical really uh, thing that we should think about, I think that Uganda now with uh, this discussion, really, uh, you know, trying to critically think about how to develop, develop. The first question is, where is the data center? Who own it? Where is the data? Who is going to own it? Because data is going to be a mineral like gold, tantanium or whatever, because that will be the, the, the critical thing that these tools called AI tool is going to be based on. So at uh, an in institution level, I think that collecting and owning our data is critical. That's the first step. If we don't own the data, then we are going, we are giving ourselves to a company somewhere else that may be very hard to control price and future development. And we are basing our future based on that. It's very risky, but yeah. The second is human resource. Somebody has already raised about it. I think that I am, I congratulate Cavendish for bringing to speed the staff and the student on AI. Really just understanding AI. In this case, my uh, feeling or our approach here is that let's approach AI as a tool like forks, knives, any other technology that we use, let's just think about tools. Let's forget about this, you know, sensational things, or oh, is it human? No, 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 no. Right now, chat, G G G chat GTP, any other AI tools, basically they are organized from the data, online resource written by somebody, and they take that and they use data to give knowledge. So the knowledge they give is of course, prone to be wrong because they are using whoever write more will dictate what chat GPT says. Whoever has more data will dictate what chat GTP is going to say. So I think that here we have an opportunity in Africa not to repeat the same mistake we did when we developed higher education. We took textbook from elsewhere written for the context for that country. And then we are you know, taking our people to outside, study PhD there and repeat all these people there with a different context. We are not you know, quoting wisdom from Africa. We are not really extracting knowledge in, to the level that we want from the region. So similarly, if we give up data to these uh, systems, 
and we use the tools, I think this will be a very, very significant uh, damage. So, and then the last one is that in this uh, practical things, let's focus more on using freely available AI tools. And then also encourage our staff to develop AI tools. I consider it as the, the purpose of uh, my operational definition of AI tools is that if we think of like airplane jet now, they have a seat, they have you know all these different components made in different parts of the, the, the world. Similarly, these AI tools, they will have a different, different, different component doing different, different things. To translate in Kenya, Rwanda to Swahili, for example, could be developed by Cavendish University and which could be part of the Google <laughs> cloud service or any other cloud services. And then we can also have a technology that we own. So what I am preaching here as a practical step is that university to create a development team to develop AI tools. And the last one uh, is uh, this policy. I think policy is very critical to have AI policy that guides an institution uh, on approach to AI. Uh, and the key takeaway also here I want to share is that I think we are now using SIS, LMIS um, in different ways, all of us. Preferably, I am a promoter of locally made LMS and SIS, because that's where we start, you know, like somebody doesn't turn it off because of like, like is what is happening now with different uh, global organization. They just take any initiative like that. So if we give ourselves to SIS, LMIS, we don't control. If somebody is angry on us with something, they can turn it off. And then what do you do? You have already lost the culture of giving face to face, and then you are, you are now in the middle of nowhere. So that's the two points I make. And the last slide, this is the last slide. Uh, I think that uh, we can pilot, we can learn and share experience on this admission chatbots. If there is some developed tools in, uh, in one of the countries in Africa, we can share technology. If there is a freely available ones, we can also share experience how we are using it. And then also, like uh, Dr. Olive, uh, Olive shared, I think that experience on immersion language learning and academic advising and testing and research publication, we can share among each other, uh, including administrative costs, so that we can quickly develop. So in conclusion, what I am saying is practically one, let's collect and own data. Two, let's think really having a cloud service located in Africa or somewhere. <laughs> Three, let's use freely available AI tools and develop by, uh, also by our own and use them. Thank you very much uh, for the attention. Uh, I hope I stay with the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, well, um, we, we, we lost a bit of time at the beginning, but you have done quite well. Uh, thank you, Professor Bailey, for um, uh, for bringing uh, you know out those practical steps, uh, particularly uh, the issue of data, which has uh, also come out in the other presentations and discussions. The issue of capacity building, uh, um, which is quite key, and I believe that uh, we should have a policies by government uh, to support capacity building in the area of AI, and of course developing our own AI tools uh, for use in higher education. Otherwise, uh, we get the bias uh, coming from data from elsewhere. Uh, in a summary form, that's what um, uh, I gleaned from uh, uh, your very um, insightful presentation. So, um, uh, uh, David, uh, I don't know how many minutes we, you can request um, uh, uh, colleagues to have so that uh, we can have maybe two, three questions uh, for the... Uh, uh, for Dr. Bailey, we had some uh, two for, 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 for Dr. Uh, Sabiti. David? Yes, Chair, if we could have questions, comments about the, the, the last two presenters within about 15 minutes. 
that will help us uh, maximum 20 minutes. That will help us to keep within the initially planned time of ending today's uh, uh, conference at 1.30. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, please, if, if you can put your comments also in the chat, that would be very helpful. But please, um, uh, those who, uh, who are giving physical uh, uh, questions, try to be as brief as possible. So I'll start with uh, Anselm. Please, can you unmute? Ajugo as Anselm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The hand has been dropped. Uh, then let's go Dafin Nahikiriza. Please unmute. Dafin Nahikiriza, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hello? Yes, please go Thank ahead. Thank you very much. And introduce you yourself. Much. Yes, please. I'm called Daphne Chirza, coming from Valley University of Science and Technology and a research coordinator. I have only two things to, to talk about and they go to our first presenter, that is Dr. Sabit. One, uh, I was wondering because there is where she said that her, her tried to do something and she got a wrong answer. So I have a question. Because we are see, saying that this machine is supposed to do it better, to do the work better than how human beings are doing it. So I have a question. If I just go to use this machine, hoping that it's going to give me a right answer, and then the very machine is the one giving me the wrong answer, what do I do? If it gives me a wrong answer, do I again ask the same machine to give me a, another answer when it has already given me a wrong one? Then number two, I'm a teacher by profession, and the, she was the doctor was addressing the issue of testing. So uh, I, I know that when we are doing the testing in teaching and learning, we are supposed to consider the three main domains of learning. That is cognitive, affective, and then psychomotor. I'm requesting Dr. Kindly to elaborate for me more on how I can test psychomotor skills using the chat PPE. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Daphne, um, for those two questions. Lynn, yeah. Lynn Thank uh, you. Uh, yes. Thank you. My name is Lynn Janet Gutu from Soroti University. Uh, my question also goes to Dr. Sabiti. Uh, the first presenter, she mentioned on issues of online assessment grading of students uh, using the current system they're using. But in relation to AI, uh, how would we then uh, maintain the quality of these assessments of students online? And in areas of cybersecurity, which is uh, becoming a bit of an issue today, how then shall we guard against such securities of data and so on? Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Kimise. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Moderator Professor Nasinyama. Uh, yes, Dr. Kimise from Kavanesh University. I think mine will be uh, leaned on the, the former presenter, Professor Bailey, about that we need to come up with our own uh, systems, especially when he talks about hosting data, but then this will be a Dr. general. Dr. Kimise, we yes. seem to have lost you. Hello, can you get me? Hello, uh, network. Hello. No, we can. Lost. We can yes. hear you, Dr. Kimise. I think chair is the one who is who is missing. You may can hear you well. Hey. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, this goes to the, the, the consortium, that is the, the Vice Chancellor's Forum, about uh, that you are well aware that uh, to have this become a reality, we need to bother about the infrastructure. 
And uh, according to the statistics uh, from national, the NITA, that is National Information Technology, it says that around, uh, we have only 5.7% in Uganda only that where people can access internet. That is at household level. And uh, when, when, you, when you look at this 5.7%, uh, 5, 5 it may be only maybe urban people. So what does it mean? It means that there are some people are excluded and there is already a digital divide. So how have you really helped maybe uh, the people and also your lobbying at government level to increase the accessibility of the internet because without the internet then this cannot be a reality it means we are just talking about a few people accessing or using the artificial intelligence or other technologies only maybe in urban areas but when the majority of the people are locked out so how have you done that or what framework what frameworks are you thinking about that everyone is brought on board in order to make this as a reality. Thank you. I don't know whether I'm good, but here I can see um, my internet. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I think the chair uh, was the one not hearing you um and so maybe david uh if you are there in the interest of, of time you could get the next questions as the chair comes back yes i have i have thank you So, Prof, you're suggesting that I I, I take the, the chair, right? Yes, you continue with that. You accept the next set of questions, uh, and then you will allow the presenters to answer or answer those those questions, and then allow time for another for the final session because I see the time is rushing. Sure. So, first of all, I should uh, thank. Um, Dr. Olive and Prof. Bailey for the presentations and the floor. Um, chair, chair is even, back, David. Yes, I can see Chair is back. So <laughs> back to you, Chair. Uh, sorry, our system um, optimizes um, at one o'clock, and uh, I think that's what happened. I had interlarded our IT person. Uh, uh, but may I know um, where we are at, David? I was uh, asking to uh, our presenters to briefly respond to uh, some of the questions that have been asked. Has that yes. been, been done? No, that is where we are. All right, thank you. So may I then requ request uh, Dr. Olim to, uh, to, 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 to have a go at it first, then we can come to Professor Bailey. Dr. Liu? Hello, Dr. Olive. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasnyama. Um, so I will start with a question by uh, Ms. Duffy from Bale University. She asked, uh, what would happen um, when you prompt uh, artificial intelligence in chat GPT in particular in this, in this instance, and it gives you a wrong answer because mm. it can give you a wrong answer. It can give you a logical answer but false logical but false so and so i wanted to say three things one when you approach artificial intelligence you should not be a clean slate you need to have some prior knowledge about whatever you check whatever you're you're searching for that is why we said we can even use it for students and ask the students to improve part of the part of the improvement that students would have to do is to check and see if the information is correct. So a student can give you a false reference and you would, you would be able to detect that. A student can give you false information. I gave the example of East African community and you should be able to, to change that. So 
one of the ways you should not be a clean slate. And then secondly, you need to, 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 to corroborate your answers gained from another from other sources, maybe the internet, maybe a book. So don't just go in and just believe everything that uh, the chatbot will tell you. And sometimes your prompting skills may be insufficient. So sub, uh, insufficiently developed. So if you chat, if you prompt it wrongly, you get wrong responses. Uh, then, uh, 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 and then of course, that is the synergy that we've been talking about. You need to apply a synergy between humans and the application you're using. Don't let it be totally dependent on the artificial intelligence. Then you also asked a question about how do we use uh, artificial intelligence to test psychomotor skills and, and actually I saw an answer to this in the chat, but now I cannot see it. But basically, uh, psychomotor skills, there's not only one artificial intelligence. There are so many different types of artificial intelligent, artificially intelligent platforms that you can use. But for example, for chat GPT, you may not be able to, to, to assess the actual movement, but you can adapt your assessment to test the to test the to test the, the whatever you're testing in text-based form. So for example, if someone, if you're teaching someone to write, to play a musical instrument, it is music, you can ask the the that artificial intelligence to describe the steps, the techniques, the considerations. Remember, we talked about moving to process other than the product. So it may not teach you, you may not test the actual movements and all that but you can use various means of adapting your assessment. The last question I think was from Miss Lynn, and I'm not very sure that I got the question very well. So if you could help me, I had, I had it was Miss Lynn, but I did not hear the question very well. So if you can guide me to that question by Miss Lynn, please. I think she was talking about how to maintain quality uh, of assessments. Okay, maintaining quality of assessment. Oh, I think she. I think she mentioned yeah, something definitely. about. I kind of remember a bit of it, but um. Anyway, maintaining quality of assessments. Uh, remember we are applying a synergy between humans and the artificial intelligence. When you when you concentrate on the process, that is going to help you to 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 assess to improve quality because a student, for example, if it is math. They will not just give you an answer. They will also show the working. If it is an essay, they will not only produce the essay and give it to you. You can use other means. For example, you can use vivas an oral presentation where a student can defend their answer, can explain to you how they came up with the different structures and arguments in the article or in the paper. So we can use different there are very many different approaches we can use to ensure quality in our assessments. Because what we what the most the biggest emphasis is we must not concentrate on memory. We must not concentrate on students remembering things from by rote. We must instead concentrate on assessing skills, in assessing application. How have the students applied whatever they have learned? to actual real life or workplace situations. Thank you. I'm not very sure if I have answered it because I didn't quite get the question. Chair, you are muted. Uh, Chair, you may have to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Olive. We, may, we now turn to Professor Bailey. I think that was... Uh, um, some yeah. questions that were directed to you. Okay, thank you very much. I, the first question is from Eric. From uh, So uh, how can we modify data from AI tools as well as reduce over dependency? So I think this is a great question. Basically, uh, you know, AI tools, they're like essentially these days, 
Python is widely used and many of the, the tools like the framework, the algorithm are freely available. So basically what I am proposing is that if you have your own data in your data storage system and you develop using this algorithm freely available and then uh, programming language like Python freely available and one can develop AI tools that can do certain tasks successfully and owned locally. So I think that just to practically, to practical, uh, to say practical things, when in my previous university, Bardar University, we say, okay, we don't use SIS from any other university, we develop it. So we say to the staff, there was a competition in the uh, two staff create a firm, they, they, they won the competition, they develop locally. So then the other university, 21 university in Ethiopia adopted it. We sell like $10 million uh, revenue out of it. The university share 10%, the uh, developer take the other uh, 90%. And now since LMI, SIS is there, they are, they are integrating into learning management system, freely available. And then they are now working to develop AI tools based on the data available in the university to uh, in, to tell you know to the teacher to inform the teacher about individual students their speed their way of learning their background mm. how that is it. so practically mm. this is something that we did i am just not telling out of a blue so this is something that can be done so uh, i think a great question but that's what i'm saying and also alex asked it like how could you kindly elaborate a bit more about access and feasibility of building an Africa owned database uh, and uh, the, the, the arrangement? So I think this is also a great question. Uh, 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 you can take you can take that together with uh, this one also um, that um, uh, getting our own cloud service is in the cost of gathering data specific to localized region regions and creating space for that data a little higher than returns in the short run. How should we, would we best go about it? I think you can tie the two. Okay, okay, okay. So thank you very much. So I think that, you know, uh, the best thing to learn uh, how technology, how these kind of services can be pushed and come to Africa is to join hands. The whole purpose of African Union, you know, when we become individually approach this big corporation, to do certain things, we are not market, you know, we are not attractive, and we are very small, and uh, they will not answer uh, very quickly. So China, for example, has a big population, a big opportunity for this big company, but they don't have a choice unless they they locate some of the technology, even share some of the technology with local company because of the market. So basically here, what we are pushing just openly to tell you with the African Union, with Africa free trade area, Africa with one voice, it can have a very strong impact on this company to put all these kind of facilities in our, in our, uh, in our continent. So this means that they cannot ignore. The market is big. So, uh, and then not only bring them here to put their, uh, you know, hardware, or uh, the, 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 the data center, but also even like Chinese did to outsource some of these AI tools they use to local company to develop. In that way, we can catch up. And then that way we can also bring content, context of African. And so that these AI tools, when it make decision, it can make decision based on the information it, 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 it get from the, from the reality, like, from the writing and from the data. So that's what, uh, there is a practical way and there is a movement in that direction. So Africa Union together is what uh, we are proposing. I think that there is also this question, Alex, you are saying reinventing the wheel. So basically, uh, this is a very good point. Uh, what we are saying here is not really reinventing the wheel. If they have like the tools, like, AI tools, algorithm. What we are saying is that instead of giving them the data to train that algorithm more about our context and then become their tools and then we buy it, why don't they give together as using market as a push factor, uh, as a pull factor, actually as a, as a factor to attract, why don't they give us the algorithm 
and then we train using our our own data and then the ai tools and the data be co-owned at least not owned completely by them so that's mm. uh, what we what uh, what we are trying to push and i think that in a discussion in a panel we had with african union there is an understanding uh, and hopefully with this africa free trade area getting operationalized uh, it's very critical because like a, a farmer in Kenya, if they want to sell today using this Africa free trade area, a product to Ethiopia, it doesn't make sense that information go to like Finland or, or Germany and then come back to Ethiopia and then the data is somewhere in Germany. So this doesn't make sense. So that's mm. the area we're trying to push. And uh, mm. I think the last question for me, I, I, I hope I capture, is access to the majority by Dr. Kim, Kim is, is that right? Kim so, what, yeah, so how we can make really the majority who don't have access to these AI tools, how are we bringing people to speed in this kind of AI tools? So that is what makes this proposal of we owning data, we developing uh, tools makes sense actually. Because nowadays, I think that the majority of African uh, population is getting exposed to mobile phones. So if we develop a contextualized AI tools that helps, let's say someone in the countryside, Kenya or Ethiopia, Rwanda get sick, can they speak in a local language to their telephone? I am uh, like, I feel like this ABC, and that the AI tools automatically respond to her or him, like this is possibility the case, and you can like like in, in speech without even knowing how to read and write. So okay. I, I think we can use the infrastructure is there, the mobile phone is there. So if we develop this, mm -hmm. I think we can bring people to speed. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Bailey. Is coming. Uh, we 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 have. Um... Uh, to stop at one thirty, as we were told, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, we can go on and on, and uh, you have just mentioned uh, the issue of um, collaboration and co-owning of data. Uh, probably we need, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, the algorithms are there. Um, uh, probably that would be one of the fastest way that we could uh, uh, develop our, our own tools through co-ownership of data. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, picking it up from you. And uh, members, uh, colleagues who are participating here may want to know, particularly Daphne, that uh, recently there was a research article that was generated wholly by chat, a chatbot, and uh, with the full with the, with the, with the, with the references. Uh, but this was just by you know uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, it was submitted to a journal, and the journal was going to publish it uh, because it was uh, you know uh, it looks so genuine. Um, until the authors started to inform the, uh, the 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 journal, the editor that this was generated by uh, artificial intelligence, and so you know um, uh, these are the challenges that we do have, and uh, we need um, uh, capacity to be able uh, to detect. Of course, the uh, the the uh, the references were 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 not true references. They were. Uh, uh, they were not, um, you know, so you need always to check um, when you're using AI to check um, a generative AI, you need always to check the accuracy of that information as uh, uh, Dr. Sabiti, um, uh, you know, informed us in her presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, thank you once again and to thank uh, um, Cavendish University together with the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum for last session. Uh, um, I would like to uh, end here and um, uh, hand back to uh, David uh, for the next uh, uh, final sh session. Over to you, David. Sure. Thank you very much, Prof. George Nasinyama, for leading a, another lively uh, session with Dr. Olive Sabiti and Prof. Bailey Dumpty. And we are pretty much coming to the end of today's virtual conference. It will be concluded with the assistance of Professor George Openjuru, the Vice Chancellor of Gulu University, who also happens to be the chairperson of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. 
I will not go so much into his credentials than to say that he previously worked as a deputy vice chancellor at the same university in charge of academic affairs and as a professor, an associate professor and dean of the School of Distance and Lifelong Learning at College of Education and External Studies at Makere University. And we are very, very privileged and honored to have him um, make some remarks and also invite our, our, our chief guest to close today's virtual conference. That is Professor Olubai Olubai, the Chief Academic Officer of Marifa Education, which is the sponsor of Cavendish University Uganda alongside several other higher educational institutions in Africa, as I had mentioned earlier at the beginning of today's virtual conference. Thank you and welcome, Professor Openjuru. As Professor Openjuru gets ready, uh, maybe just to say that I could just give a snapshot on Professor Olubai Olubai, who is going to close today's virtual conference. He's the one waving, uh, Professor Olubai Olubai. He's a great thinker. He's a, a, a philosopher um, who has spent expense, a, extensive time here in Africa, but also in the US, researching, uh, supervising graduate students, and reading. And besides being the, the chief academic officer of Marifa Education, he's the chair of the University Council of Cavendish University of Uganda and the former chair of KCA University in Kenya. Uh, a former member of the University Council of KCA University, my, my apologies. And he has also been a president of the International University of East Africa, IUEA, here in Kampala, um, and a professor at several universities, an advisor to local and international NGOs, is an, a mentor to many academicians. And he, he has written a book called Education for a Better World. And I believe he has also written some short books for children, if I remember well. So, uh, you know, with the assistance of Professor Openjuru and some closing remarks, if not, I will invite uh, Prof. Mogisha John Francis, the Vice of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum to do the honors and invite Professor Olubai Olubai. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, I will deputize the chair, because I'm the vice chair of Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. It would have been a pleasure, because I think Professor Penjura has been in the forum and, and has been on, uh, in the conference. But uh, thank you for introducing Professor Olubai Olubai. Um, and uh, I have read Education for Eta World. And, um, some of the other works of Professor Olubai Olubai. Uh, he is a thinker. I'm not saying that we, the rest of us don't think, but <laughs> I think uh, we have gifted, uh, high organized thinkers. Uh, he is a writer. Uh, he is an innovator and he owns uh, a patent. Uh, in his area of microbiology for some discovery. Um, and he's an academic leader. And he is very, very passionate about technology. Um, and I must also inform the others uh, that being a chief academic officer of Marifa Education that sponsors CUU, he has actually been um, one, he has been a force. Uh, uh, behind our technology advancement as as a university. So pleasure to welcome you, uh, Professor Olubai Olubai, to give concluding remarks 
and uh, to close this function at this 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 conference. And I would request after you have closed the the, the conference officially uh, that we all put on uh, activate our videos for uh, a virtual group photo. Thank you, Professor Olubai. You are welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Mugisha. I hope you can all hear me. Prof. Yes, Mugisha, we can, can you hear see me? you. We yes, can see you and can hear you. Can hear you see. Okay, okay. Because if it changes, then I'll, I'll remove my headphones. Uh, first of all, a very big thank you to um, Professor Mugisha for uh, organizing this conference and for those very kind remarks. Um, equally, a big thank you to our executive director at Cavendish University, Mr. David Mutanabura, for his uh, very kind remarks as well, and for the good work they have done together with Dr. Olive in, um, in actually pulling in colleagues across East Africa to discuss advances in technology. And uh, this is not the first time they have done it. They have continued to do it. Um, so really, a special thank you to um, the National Council for Higher Education and the chairman, Professor Katsunguka, for, for joining today's conference. A special thank you to the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. Um, a special thank you to all of Cavendish University. A uh, special thank you to Professor Bailey. It was good to see you. Um, and, and for your really very strong emphasis on Africa has to own a piece of these technologies as the advanced, as Dr. Bailey, you emphasized. Special thank you to uh, Dr. Oscar Correa for giving us the history of AI, uh, Professor Jude Lubega for making it very clear to us what AI is and how it can be used currently. All vice chancellors present, all academics present and all people attending today. Thank you very much for coming together. And the good news is that this has been recorded. So just like uh, Professor Bailey emphasized, we need to share these ideas and share the work. So I would urge Cavendish University to share this recording. Um, for discussion both at Cavendish and at all the other universities that may be interested in, uh, in, in sharing this recording with the faculty and with the students, because we have to do our own work, and this is an example of it. And we're actually using the same tools we're discussing today to make it possible for all of us to come to this conference together. I'm actually joining you from a tiny village in Western Kenya. This is Barack Obama's ancestral home. I'm here today. We came to see their library and the good work they do for children in this rural village. But guess what? These technologies are allowing me to be with all of you at the same time. So the power of these technologies is so great. And I'm glad that we've spent the last three plus hours making it clear to all or to each other how powerful the technologies are and how we need to actually become active participants in both the development and the use of these technologies. And uh, Professor Bailey, of course, emphasized that we must think of these as tools. And Dr. Olive made it very clear that we must be thinking in terms of how what this means for assessments and what it means for learning. Um, recent books that I've read on AI that, that I find quite instructive is, first of all, just for popular reading, which is this is accessible even to someone at primary school level, is uh, more Godard's Scary Smart, which talks about what AI is doing today and what it will do in the future. Highly accessible, very easy to read. I think we should popularize it and perhaps write our own version of uh, Scary Smart, introducing the general public to AI, how to think about it. Um, then Henry Kissinger, the book that recently came out, co-authored with um, Eric Schmidt from Google and Daniel Hortenlocker from MIT. And they're talking about the age of AI and the human future. And they make a very clear emphasis that this may actually now be the fifth industrial revolution because AI, according to them, is an inflection point in human history where machines really begin to do what we thought was science fiction, but they are able to do it. And so it's up to us to really broaden how we imagine the uses of these technologies. Um, and also, again, as we all know, there's an, a scary element to it. Major, major technology experts that even called for a moratorium of six months um, but of course, that moratorium is not going on. The rest of the world is competing very actively. Uh, Dr. Correa emphasized the competition between the West and the rest of Asia. These are going on. Most of you will remember this famous um, statement by George Santayana in 1905, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
So I think for Africa, in a more broad sense, part of why we must actually worry about our relationship with AI as a technology and as a set of tools is that our own history shows us that when we fell behind in technology about 500 years ago, because remember 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, Africa was ahead. When we fell behind, we actually became slaves. We were enslaved. So there's a real danger in not, we can't afford to fall behind because our own history tells us that when you fall behind, you may be enslaved. Now for Asia, when Asia fell behind, it was colonized. Uh, in, 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 at the beginning of the, um, in, at the beginning of the 1700s, um, India, for example, was one of the most advanced countries in the world, and something like a quarter of the global GDP was India. That's uh, early 1700s. But when India fell behind, the UK, tiny island, colonized India. So, so really, there's a danger in falling behind the power of tools and weapons. And if we make a mistake of falling behind, we shall be recolonized and we shall be, ens be enslaved. Some may argue that we have already been recolonized and enslaved, but that's open for debate. So, so point is, we can't really afford to fall behind. Now, Asia is fighting back successfully um, and is, is not at any risk of being recolonized or re-enslaved. But Africa isn't, and that is something for African universities and schools to worry about dramatically. We really, really need to worry about this. Now, Oscar made it very clear that the success of development of AI depends on computer science, which, as we all know, is based on a knowledge of mathematics. That's one. And two, depends on a knowledge and understanding of mathematics. And three, it depends on domain knowledge. So that means if you want AI for medicine, you have to know medicine. The scholars or the people working together have to know medicine. If you want AI for agriculture, you have to do the same thing. But notice the foundation of all of these things is something that doesn't actually cost money. And that is mathematics. It costs almost no money. And my own finding over the last 15 years is that we have fallen behind in mathematics completely. My challenge to all of you at this conference is the following. Please go to the nearest public secondary school, not private, and go to grade 11 or grade 12 and randomly select four children and ask them what is six times seven. Half of them or perhaps all of them will not even know it. So, so really, the, the children that are to come to university, we're now at a point where they don't even know basic math. So we must worry about that. And I would urge the universities to do what American universities do. I think we actually need to begin having assessments in all our universities for entry students, assessment so that we know how to place them. For those of you who have studied in the United States, you know that all students, including those that arrive with straight A's, must do an assessment in English and mathematics. And then they are placed into English classes, writing classes, and into mathematics classes based on that assessment. So the aim of the assessment is not so that you are excluded from the university, but so that you are placed into the appropriate set of classes for the development of your numeracy and your writing skills and communication skills. So that's one suggestion that I would make that we should all consider for all our students are in the university who don't have basic numeracy skills. I would also appeal to all universities to develop a relationship with the nearest high school and primary school so that we assist these children with basic mathematics. Our, our students can be volunteers in those neighboring high schools. Africa is at a dramatic risk when it comes to numeracy, which means we're at risk for failure in STEM and therefore failure in the development of AI. We cannot really participate if, our, if the majority of the population cannot even do the time table. In other words, if we can't count, we can't talk of AI. So I would really appeal to all of us to play an active role in doing something about this. Then also, since, um, since we need to collaborate and talk together as universities, and we have a regulator present as well, we need to worry about the following question. And you can all check this on Google. If you go on Google and actually check um, the grading system for, say, Introduction to Computer Science at MIT or at Cambridge University, or at Stanford University or at Harvard, they do not have what we have, 70% final exam or 60% final exam. This is a disaster, okay? Most of our universities are literally giving you a grade based on memorization. You are memorizing things that now AI tools can do. So we are not doing what Dr. Olive called for in this conference. 
which is to have broad assessments that include assessing process. If I, as a student, know that 70% of my grade is decided by a final exam or 60% is decided by final exam, then as a human being, my temptation will be to wait for the last three weeks, memorize some nonsense that is linked to the syllabus, look at past papers, and I actually pass the course. But I end up being useless in the, in the world of work, in the world of research, in the world of uh, development of tools, because the school system has simply prepared me to memorize and regurgitate. Uh, Dr. Olive shared this famous um, statement or quote or insight that education shouldn't be about filling pails. It should be about lighting fires. To the extent that we continue to focus on the final exam as the basis of thinking about our education, we become participants in ensuring that the education is a source of failure. So, so really, um, I, I'll close by saying, please let us reformulate assessment. Let us talk with the regulators and forget the nonsense of 60%, 70% final exams. At Harvard, for very many classes at MIT, the final exam is 20%. So that students are focused on, they are being assessed for developing tools. They are being assessed for demonstrating skills. They are being assessed for showing what they can do, not what they can simply memorize. There is no point in memorizing a lot of things that your, your phone can quickly answer for you. So this is really, really important. Um, human beings will continue to compete. So we as Africans have to be aware that the winners in this continuing competition, which has been ongoing for, for thousands of years, will be human beings with the best tools and weapons and the losers will be those with the worst tools and weapons. Thank you very much. And I'm really glad to have been part of this uh, conversation. Dear guest presenters and participants, uh, we now have come to the end of today's virtual conference on artificial intelligence in teaching and learning. There's an African proverb that says, once the big drum has been sounded, you don't sound a small drum. So I want to try to dissect what Prof. Oluba has said, though I am sure we're all challenged. On behalf of Cavendish University Uganda and the Uganda Vice-Chancellor's Forum, please allow me to first of all thank Prof. Olubai Olubai, the chair of the Cavendish University Uganda University Council, for giving us very, very insightful remarks for us to take away. Um, from this conference. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters and you, our guests who have attended, but in a unique way to thank the leadership of Cavendish University Uganda and the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum who co-organized this uh, conference. For those of you who uh, shared with us, your right email contacts when you are registering will be able to send you the materials and on, on at this note it's just to thank you for sparing a lot of your time and i hope that it has been worthwhile for your learning for sharing um, your insights on this subject and to look forward to the next uh, have a great day have a great remainder of the week goodbye thank you david and we can put our cameras for a minute just for a group a group photo if you can put your camera um thank you thank you um the secretariat susan uh of the vice chancellor's forum and sandra of cu will help us to, to take photo please let us know when this is done uh, thank you, Prof. I'm currently taking, so on the count of one, two, three, may you please smile? One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very the group much. photo is done. So thanks, thank thanks much, all Sandra. of you. Uh, thank you. Nice uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Cavendish. Bye.